right honorable speaker, honorable members of parliament, I stand before you on the authority of His Excellency President Nana Dudanko Akufuado to present the mid-year fiscal policy review of the budget statement and economic policy of the government of Ghana for the 2023 financial year. Today's presentation is in fulfillment of Section 28 of the Public Financial Management Act 2016, Act 20, Fiscal Policy Review of the Budget Statement and Economic Policy of the Government of Ghana for the 2023 financial year. Today's presentation is in fulfillment of Section 28 of the Public Financial Management Act 2016, Act 921, and Regulation 24 of the Public Financial Management Regulation, LI2378. I respectfully, Mr. Speaker, request that the entire 2023 media fiscal policy review document is captured in the Hansard. The International Reserve buffers three months of import by the end of the program. The Bank of Ghana is pursuing enhanced flood worsening rate policies to help rebuild international reserves. Six, to restore sustainability and preserve financial stability following the domestic debt exchange program to support private investments and growth. And seven, to pursue reforms to encourage private investments, strengthen growth, and create more jobs. Mr. Speaker, it is instructive to note that our path towards securing an approved IMF-supported program has been characterized by speed and resoluteness. More specifically, the following key and significant milestones were accomplished. We achieved staff level agreement in December 2022, six months after we formally requested for the IMS support to back our PCPEG. We were supported by China's agreement to co chair Ghana's Paris Club Official Creditor Committee. We secured financing assurances for the Official Credit Committee co-chaired by China and France on 12 May 2023, five months after our formal request in December 2022. We secured an IMF board approval on 17 May 2023, five months after the SLA, and 10 months after a formal request for a fund program. We also secured IMF financing equivalent to three times Ghana's quota. We front-loaded disbursement of IMF resources or 40% in 2023, and the rest to be spread between 2024 and 2026, and successfully concluded a domestic exchange program. The results are clear. We are witnessing the catalytic impact of crowding in other resources. We are in discussions with the World Bank for a 900 million development policy operation and emergency support. The United States, through the International Development Finance Corporation, has announced a program to invest 300 million towards the construction of a data center under the G7 Partnership for Global Infrastructure and Investments. This is through the Development Finance Corporation of the U.S. Mr. Speaker, several key stakeholders played diverse roles in Ghana's successful journey towards approval of the IMF-supported program. On behalf of His Excellency the President, I would like to again express our sincere gratitude to the Right Honorable Speaker, members of Parliament, our participating bondholders, retirees, financial institutions, and other stakeholders who played critical roles. Permit me to express our sincere gratitude to the Managing Director of the IMF, a team led by its country director, Stefan Roder and the executive board for providing the unfathomable cooperation throughout the whole process. We are also grateful to the World Bank Group, the U.S. Treasury, U.S. Development Finance Corporation. Government appreciates our other development partners, both multilaterals, AFDB and AFRI-EXIM, and bilaterals for their support under the program. Mr. Speaker, as a nation, we must and will prevail. Indeed, our only recourse is to be successful 
at the upcoming first review of the program in September 2023 and all other subsequent reviews. We are therefore respectfully calling on every member of this August House and all our fellow Ghanaians to support these reforms. Mr. Speaker, to support the effective implementation of the IMF-supported PCPEG, the government has put in place an implementation strategy. Status of progress towards achieving the program objectives. Mr. Speaker, the IMF-supported program will be monitored and reviewed semi-annually based on agreed targets to be met by end June and end December each year. We will prepare for a comprehensive assessment of the targets by the IMF during the first review in September 2023, which will assess nine structural benchmarks, six quantitative performance criteria, and three indicative targets in 2023. Reference that is going to lay it, and the question of whether it should be laid or not has risen. Mr. Speaker, I also heard you say we would debate it from tomorrow. We'll make comments. Comment. Oh, comments, not debate. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I, I, I suppose that um, laying it might not be necessary at all because when statements are made, when statements are made and we make comments, I have not seen one statement being made and then it's laid. It is, it is, a statement is made and then we comment on it. Nobody lays a statement. That's my thinking. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, this is a statement and it relates to government policy. Mr. Speaker, I thought my honorable colleague and friend who's been in this house for quite a while would rather lead us onto the path of righteousness. Mr. Speaker, whenever reviews are made which do not include supplementary budgets, supplementary budgets, they are laid on the table for us. Mr. Speaker, as my colleague from Boku Central has indicated, it is not possible with such documents to read the entirety of the document. Certainly you may skip some. And if you don't even leave it, assume you even read everything. The Hansa Department may not be able to capture everything. For purposes of doubly checking, assuming we've even read everything, it's important that we have a copy with us to serve as a benchmark. So, Mr. Speaker, I don't see why we should be litigating this matter. It's by convention and practice that is what we've been doing, with the greater respect. But having said so, Mr. Speaker, you asked for an indication. And my colleague, the minority leader, who at the very outset was indulging the finance minister to move a motion outside what is required to be done by the minister. Now wants to begin his own debate. Again, outside the arrangement that we have made in this house. He was part of the business committee that agreed that we will stand the debate down. Even on the floor of this house and this mid-year fiscal policy review statement. That being so, this is a very, very official statement in respect of the government's economic policy for the mid-year. I think that for the avoidance of doubt, it will be prudent for us to lay it, so that it will be prudent for us to lay it, to lay the statement read by the minister, so that members can officially access it and then contribute to the debate. I, I, I will prefer that than, not today, not say today, yes, but I'm raising the issue, I'm contributing to the issue of whether it should be late or not. 2022 was the most difficult year for me as Ghana's finance minister. On July 1st, 2022, we took what was then a difficult but necessary decision to request support from the IMF to implement our post-COVID-19 program of economic growth. The country was going through a dire period of economic uncertainties and despondency. Mr. Speaker, we have turned the corner and more importantly, we are determined to continue down that path. Soon, we expect the measures taking resulting economic activity 
greater than anything experienced in the history of the Fourth Republic. Our plans and programs should soon lead to a sustained increase in domestic production, including manufacturing and farming, replacing many of the products that we are used to importing. Mr. Speaker, when I presented the 2023 budget in November last year, I indicated that we will pursue major fiscal and monetary policy measures within the framework of the PCPEG. Our coordinated response to the macro fiscal challenge charges to develop in March 2022 before going to the IMF, that's the PCPEG. Mr. Speaker, we have turned the corner and more importantly, we are determined to continue down that path. Mr. Speaker, when I presented the 2023 budget in November last year, I indicated that I will pursue major fiscal and monetary policy measures within the framework of the PCPEC. This is why we got into the IMF. You were spending too much relative to revenues, which is true. You were borrowing too much, which is true. Your external payments position has deteriorated, which is true. And so you ended up, your growth is reducing, which is true. So you ended up at the IMF, and the IMF would impose certain conditions, which is true. And if you don't do certain things right, you will get, you will not, the anchor will not hold, which is true. So I'm not quite sure uh, what it is that is not true that I said. Uh, but I think, um, unfortunately, the supporters of this government and this government itself are very uh, reluctant to admit the truth even when it hits them in the face. Yeah. True. Thank you about that. The eventual passage of all fiscal measures in the 2023 budget by the House and the completion of the DDP program. I have also discussed the significant improvements in the key macroeconomic indicators, including inflation, exchange rate, interest rates, reserve position, growth rate, and the performance of the bank since 2022. Mr. Speaker, all these developments, together with the need to align with the targets of the IMS-supported PCPEC program, warrant a division to the macroeconomic framework. This was necessary because the framework was guided by the September 2022 data that underpinned the 2023 budget in November 2022. Go to the IMF today, we will not go to IMF tomorrow, and we are not going as long as the NPP remains in power. Exactly. Mr. Speaker, looking beyond the supported PCPEC has also prioritized social protection reforms to ensure that the vulnerable are protected from the impact of the ongoing fiscal adjustment. Social spending on health, social protection and education will be closely monitored to ensure timely disbursement of funds to beneficiaries. In addition, an indexation mechanism for benefits under the LEAP program will be put in place by end September 2023. Furthermore, the coverage of LEAP will be expanded and its targeting improved to cover the stream of by 2024. I we IMF IMF we also secured IMF financing equivalent to three times Ghana's quota. We front-loaded disbursement of IMF resources with 40% in 2023 and the rest to be spread between 2024 and 2026 and successfully concluded a domestic exchange program. The results are clear. We are witnessing the catalytic impact of crowding in other resources. We had discussions with the World Bank for a 900 million development policy operation and emergency support. The United States through the International Development Finance Corporation has announced a program to invest 300 million toward the construction of a data center under the G7 Partnership for Global Infrastructure and Investments. This is through the Development Finance Corporation of the US. Mr. Speaker, 
several key stakeholders play diverse roles in Ghana's successful journey towards approval of the IMS supported program. On behalf of His Excellency the President, I would like to again express our sincere gratitude to the Right Honourable Speaker, Members of Parliament, our participating bondholders, retirees, financial institutions, and other stakeholders who played critical roles. Bailout or whatever. We go, we're going to IMF for bailout. Do you know the meaning? The meaning is that people don't know. The minute you say you want to go to IMF, it means that you are going to tell the IMF that the IMF, please, me Ghana, I can't manage my economy. So come and help manage it. That's the meaning. You, immediately you say you are going for a bailout. And immediately you take that decision. Then you, immediately you are going to tell them. And do you know what the people they will bring? They won't bring their expert to. The, 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 the deputy finance minister was telling me that. I said, all the IMF meetings they have had, high level meetings, small, small boys. Who come and take the decision? That's one boy. Small, small boys. Who come and then, hey, hey, Ghana, do this. The amount comprises receipts from the 63rd to the 68th liftings from the Jubilee Field, the 20th and 21st liftings from the 10 fields, and the 9th and 10th and 11th liftings from the Sankofa Jinyami Field. In addition to the total receipts for the year under review, petroleum receipts that spilled over from 2021 to 2022 was $14.82 million, bringing the total amount distributed to $1.44 billion. This compares to the amount distributed of $808.6 million for the same period in 2021. A total of $581.5 million was transferred into the Ghana Petroleum Funds 2022 compared to 222, $227 million in 2021. Out of the amount transferred, the Ghana Heritage Fund received 174 million against 68 million in 2021, while the Ghana Civilization Fund received 407.06 million compared to 159.24 million in 2021. Go to the IMF today, we will not go to IMF tomorrow, and we are not going as long as the NPP remains in power. Mr. Security continues to be a priority of government. The United Nations recently reported that over 1,800 terrorist attacks resulting in nearly 4,600 deaths were recorded in our West Africa region in the first six months of this year. Due to this instability, among others, increasing numbers of West African citizens are seeking refuge in our country. This has required a review of our security expenditures within the limited fiscal space. Security continues to be a priority of government. The United Nations recently reported that over 1,800 terrorist attacks resulting in nearly 4,600 deaths were recorded in our West Africa region in the first six months of this year. Due to this instability, among others, increasing numbers of West African citizens are seeking refuge in our country. This has required a review of our security expenditures Within the limited fiscal space. I do not yet do a mining you up. And it's a core IMF, coach, they say, Minimum answer, into one of the movement. I'm a sanitary. I'm not going to do sanitary. I'm a chess and watch it. I'm a woman. That's how much I am, fat baby. Ah, who catch that gun of what you name the Albu Boomer? I do not yet do a mining you up. And this is what I am of coach. They say, Minim Yansa, into one woman of a woman. I am a sanitary. Naga would be sanitary. I am a chess and watch it. I am a woman. That's how much I am for the other. Who catch that gun of what you name the Albu Boomer? We all listen to the funeral dead. At some point, I had to wake up and ask them to wake up from sleep and listen to the man. So when they finally got up and said, yeah, yeah, they were sleeping. So I was surprised when they suddenly woke up, they were shouting when they hadn't heard the man speaking. But like my leader said, the finance minister says he has turned the corner. The finance minister says he has turned the corner. You have turned the corner when inflation is 42%? Is that the corner? 
you have turned the corner when you are reporting that even by the end of the year, your reserves will only be 0 0.8 months. That is less than one month of reserves at the Bank of Ghana. And you said that is turning the corner. You have turned the corner when the governor and the MPC just recently increased monetary policy rate to 30%. You have turned the corner when the Bank of Ghana has reported that the city has depreciated by 30%. So quite clearly, he is not even near the corner, let alone to turn it. You have turned the corner when your central bank, the Bank of Ghana, has actually recorded negative reserves at the Bank of Ghana to the tune of 70 billion Ghana cities. What it means is that all the monies in our banks that they force them to save with the Bank of Ghana that we call Prudential Reserves, Sikanashi, Bank of Ghana has wasted all that money. All the money they've been borrowing from abroad in foreign currency to support the city is gone. As a matter of fact, if you even take away government debt that they have impaired of 48 billion, you will see, see that the Bank of Ghana has a hole of 22 billion. So it is not government. And you come here and say you have turned the corner. What this means is that the Bank of Ghana itself, as we speak, is not fit for purpose. But today, this is just on the surface. But you know, they released the Bank of Ghana auditor report on Friday, hoping that Saturday, Sunday, we'll be attending funerals and churches. And then Monday, Ken Oforiata will take our attention away. Tell the governor, after tomorrow, we are back to the Bank of Ghana audit report. Are we good to go? Um, good afternoon. First, let me say that it is wrong for our minister responsible for finance to say that he has successfully turned the corner. That can never be the case. In fact, according to Adongo, he's not even close to the corner. What he has successfully done, indeed, is that he has deepened the woes of the ordinary Ghanaian. I say this for a simple reason. Because of certain factors that the statement has outlined. <coughs> First, he has revised economic growth from 2.8% of GDP to 1.5% of GDP. This clearly shows that the economy is contracting and it is declining and obviously it's going to affect jobs and the welfare of the ordinary Ghanaian. Remember that in the year 2022, the overall GDP growth was 2.2%. He announced it was 3.1%. He announced in the 2023 budget in November, when he appeared before us, that the economy is expected to grow at 2.8%. I had indicated to him that with all what is happening in the economy, there is no way Ghana's economy can grow at 2.8%. Today, and finally, the chicken has come home to be roasted. He has informed us that the economy is going down and down, and to the extent that GDP growth is going to be 1.5% by the end of the year 2023. Even this, I have my doubt. Because looking at all what is happening, if care is not taken, we will struggle to see economic growth at above 1%. As if that is not enough, our minister today informed us. And again, in the 2022, 2023 budget that was read in November, he indicated that he's not going to borrow from the domestic market at all. Zero financing from the domestic market. Sadly, today, he has informed us that he has gone ahead without parliamentary approval and have borrowed from the T-bill market an amount of 5.5 billion Ghana cities. And as if that is not enough, he's going to borrow another 41.3 billion before the year ends. So colleagues, no wonder inflation is still going up and rising. No wonder that the central bank is busily increasing monetary policy rate. No wonder that lending rate is still going up. I wouldn't be surprised 
that at the end of the year, inflation will not make any headway. This is a gangantuan missed opportunity. Ghana had the opportunity to reduce lending rate downwards under 15%. Unfortunately, due to the activities of government, particularly the over borrowings and over expenditure from government, Ghana's lending rate and market rates are still going up. TB rate not long ago was about 14%. Today we are doing about 23, 24, 25. We may end up in the 30s before the year ends. The third one has to do with the fact that he's saying that the city has stabilized. Our brothers and sisters from the media, the Ghana city has stabilized relatively because we have defaulted in the payment of our external debt. If you were to look into the budget, by this time we should have serviced our debt, external debt, approximately 11 billion Ghana cities. Because we have defaulted in servicing our debt owned to Eurobond lenders, China, Saudi Arabia, India, UK, Japan, France, Czech Republic, and many more countries. I don't know of Togo, but it could be that we owe them. <laughs> but because we owe all these countries and because we have failed to service this debt, we have made some savings that is supporting our balance of payment. It is not because he has turned the corner. By the end of the year, as early as January 2024, we will start servicing this debt. And if we are to start servicing this debt, don't be surprised that our currency, the city, will start depreciating once again. So it is not true that they have turned the corner. They have rather deepened our woes. This is just the foundation. My colleague and the ranking member, Honorable Adongo, will speak and then make some comment as the ranking member of the Finance Committee of Ghana's Parliament. And tomorrow, we urge the people of Ghana and all of you to pay attention to what we will say starting the debate on the media review. I think we've missed a golden opportunity to turn around our economy. We are rather messed you up as the people of Ghana. And this has been superintended by Mr. Strategist, the Vice President. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. I think my leader is in full flight. I'm sure if you give him the opportunity, he will start the debate right away. So, <laughs> uh, We all listen to the funeral dance. At some point, I had to wake up and ask them to wake up from sleep and listen to the man. So when they finally got up and said, yeah, yeah, they were sleeping. So I was surprised when they suddenly woke up, they were shouting when they hadn't heard the man speaking. But like my leader said, the finance minister says he has turned the corner. You have turned the corner when inflation is 42%. Is that the corner? You have turned the corner when you are reporting that even by the end of the year, your reserves will only be 0 0.8 months. That is less than one month of reserves at the Bank of Ghana. And you said that is turning the corner. You have turned the corner when the governor and the MPC just recently increased monetary policy rate to 30%. You have turned the corner when the Bank of Ghana has reported that the city has depreciated by 30%. So quite clearly, he is not even near the corner, let alone to turn it. You have turned the corner when your central bank, the Bank of Ghana, has actually recorded negative reserves at the Bank of Ghana to the tune of 70 billion Ghana cities. That is the total borrowing. But our reserve position at the Bank of Ghana today is negative 70 billion. What it means is that all the monies in our banks that they force them to save with the Bank of Ghana that we call prudential reserves. Sikanashi, Bank of Ghana has wasted all that money. All the monies they've been borrowing from abroad in foreign currency to support the city is gone. 
As a matter of fact, if you even take away government debt that they have impaired of 48 billion, you will see, see that the Bank of Ghana has a whole of 22 billion. So it is not government. And you come here and say you have turned the corner. What this means is that the Bank of Ghana itself, as we speak, is not fit for purpose. Because Bank of Ghana, as we speak today, cannot undertake monetary policy without printing money, because it doesn't have money. And yet you say you have turned the corner. Tomorrow we will tell him whether he's even on site. But today, this is just on the surface. But you How can government be seeking to contract this magnitude of non-concessional loans at this time when it does not have enough cash to meet statutory payments? This is like an alcoholic who has just been convinced to enter rehab. And just a few days before rehab, ask for a carton of whiskey. <laughs> Can this person be trusted to keep or to stay with the rehab program? Undertaking this additional borrow would mean that the anchor is not likely to hold and it would compromise the objective of fiscal consolidation and debt sustainability. Given Ghana's economic situation, this bailout program will require a commitment to fiscal discipline that will test the resolve of any government in any developing country, such as ours. And it is important that the government understands what it has signed up for. We should all be prepared for some painful adjustments. How can government be seeking to contract this magnitude of non-concessional loans at this time when it does not have enough cash to meet statutory payment. To give legal backing to the process of fiscal consolidation, the government is likely to be required by the IMF to pass a fiscal responsibility law. A fiscal responsibility law will require governments to declare and commit to a fiscal policy that can be monitored. It includes rules and provisions for transparency and sanctions. Mr. Chairman, in my lecture last year, and earlier in November 2013, when I delivered the Aliu Mahama Memorial Lecture, I offered the same piece of advice to government, but the Minister of Finance responded that it was not necessary. Today, because it is the IMF offering the solution, the government response is that it is very necessary. Mr. Chairman, to prevent the runaway printing of money by the central bank to finance the large deficits of government, the IMF is requiring that Bank of Ghana reduces its lending to government to zero by 2016. Zero. This means that in 2016, Bank of Ghana would not be allowed to lend even a person to the government. What is the difference between the ordinary thief and a political thief? Number one, the ordinary thief steals your money, your bag, your watch, and your jewelry, isn't it? But the political thief steals your future, your career, your education, your health, and your business. Number two, the hilarious part is that the ordinary thief will choose whom to rob. But you are the one who choose the political thief to rob you. Because we choose them. We vote them. We blindly say we are not blind. Who is deceiving who? The ridiculous part of the whole issue is that we will fight to defend and protect our belongings from the ordinary thief. Is it not? But we fight each other to defend and protect the political team. Is that not what we do? Thugs will be fighting themselves to protect those that are stealing our career, stealing our job, stealing our health, stealing our success. If you reach a certain stage in life and there is nobody who can look you in the eye and tell you the truth, you are doomed. And that is where our country has got into. We need to rescue this country. We are lying. And I feel very terrible as a Ghanaian at this time. This country is in serious trouble, ladies and gentlemen. We are in serious trouble. We need to rescue this country, ladies and gentlemen. 
the presidency has been so depraved, so, so muddied, so dirty, that I tell you in all sincerity as a Ghanaian, that I feel terribly sad today as a Ghanaian. We need to rescue this country. Wallahi. Insha Allah. Please don't cry. We shall rescue our country. Government is broke, government is broke. The people are spending billions to go inside the government that is broke. Have you ever seen a minister who resigned because government is broke before? Government has no money. Have you ever seen a governor who said, uh, ladies and gentlemen, when I was elected, I thought the government had money. Now I discover government has no money, I resign. Have you ever seen it? Government has no money, but they are bringing money out at election time. Where is that money coming from? So they are lying. What is happening is that there are two types of wicked people in government. Type one, they eat current money. Any money they find in government, they will eat it. They are wicked about that one. There is type two. Type two, they eat current money and future money. They will say, ah, oh, um, my term will end next year. When I leave, how will I eat money? Let me borrow money now. Um, borrow money of the future and eat it now. Right, hello, good morning, and welcome to the show. This is Good Morning Ghana Live on Metro TV. It's a brand new month, of course, the month of August. Uh, today is the first day of August 2023. And by His grace, we are live and we're here with yet another edition of the show. Our gratitude to God's almost high God for the very privilege of being alive and, of course, the opportunity of having another conversation around the top stories making the rounds here in our dear Republic. I'll let you into our panel for the morning's conversation shortly. But let's take a look at the front pages of our newspapers, Daily Graphic. Media budget review. Economy shows signs of recovery. Finance minister. New GDP target signals decline. Minority. Ghana elected to World Tourism Organization Executive Council. 300 million US dollars dispute. Court places injunction on mining firm. Tertiary students visit NCA. Ghanaian Times. At media budget presentation, government targets new growth strategy to return economy to debt sustainability by 2028. Create industrial parks, economic zones for sustainable growth. Russia, Africa resolved to develop mutual partnerships. Ghana elected to UN WTO Executive Council. Minority dismisses finance minister's economic recovery claim. Daily Guide. <coughs> We are back to business. Ken, <coughs> as minority cries foul, court stops Cassius mining. NPP names polling stations ahead of Comfa. Bahanta West MP denies resigning. Pius Ajide contested to German MPP seat. The New Crusading Guide, 2023 budget review. Ferriata announces vigorous policies. Abako Mahini clan to install new Akutia. He promises to bring unprecedented development to Akutia. Napo receives Doctor of Educational Leadership Banners from UCC. NPP members ambushed by Osajide. President nomination forms to him to contest his German seat. Ochiinis Akwansrahini accused of grabbing and destroying farmlands in Ayenswano. UK Ghana Gold Mining Program launched to sanitize small scale mining. Don't engage in examination more practices. Offensive North NPP parliamentary candidate to students. The insight. Ishmael Yamsin, he says IMF, World Bank, should be blamed for Ghana's economic crisis. Youth wing of socialist movement of Ghana calls for end to bullying in schools. Ex-president Kufo urges government to be transparent and accountable to Ghanaians. Victim in Teshi shooting incident wants IGP to ensure justice. U.S. colonies in Europe are called NATO, says Russian diplomat. The Daily Statesman, stabilization of economy on course. Finance minister calls for support of citizens. 50 million US dollars BII support for SMEs. Communications Minister inaugurates rural telephony networks in northern region. Files pledges improved livelihoods for SO German. The finder. <clears throat> 2023 GDP growth revised to 1.5%. Headline inflation pegged at 31.3%. Ghana joins Executive Council of UN World Tourism Organization. Government focused on environment that encourages investment, fosters entrepreneurship. UK government supports Ghana with 3.9 million pounds to sanitize small-scale mining sector. 
Venture Capital Trust Fund blows 1.7 million cities on CEO's residence, but it is not occupied in four years. And the Economy Times, cost of credit to rise steadily. Bank of Ghana exposure, stock and bonds undergo 50% haircut. First National Bank resumes Forex trading. And that's about it for the front pages. We'll be back shortly. Enjoy the fruits of your labor, they say. But as humans, aging and physical infirmity stands our way of enjoying our mansions and homes. It often becomes challenging, if not impossible, to use our stairways day in, day out. With portable American pneumatic vacuum elevators, PVEs, you are assured of unlimited enjoyment of your mansions and homes. It's a self-supported elevator for vertical movement of humans and goods at homes and offices. The original comes in three custom-made models with wheelchair accessibility call it luxury but it's a necessary imperative for vertical mobility do not let aging or infirmity limit you get one for your easy vertical mobility at home it's affordable and can be installed in just three days without modification to your existing building it's however easier to incorporate it at the construction stage we also have traditional fuji elevators and escalators for your high-rise buildings and malls visit lifts and elevators company limited at sakumono for your elevators nationwide for free consultation to call or whatsapp us on 0200-535-515 lifts and elevators the elevator people everybody knows acrobato and if you know acrobato it means you know m punch homeopathy clinic m punch homeopathy clinic is my pillar let's hear what others are saying about m punch homeopathy clinic who will be careful m punch one ha and everything me just say my name kweye and first one my name nyina and am agina sabema na me be for there e ho na nyina e ji arisa you got everything a hard secret m point is my secret m point from your party clinic i'm free do you need a place with a stunning view and serene environment just beneath the green mountains with a commercial center and recreational area with an amazing park then look no further hello sir hi Welcome to Rehoboth Havens, the most affordable yet luxurious gated community located in Damfa, Accra. We have two and three bedroom houses with spacious park. Let me show you. All of our rooms come with beautiful porcelain tiles. Durable fitted kitchen cabinets. Constant water supply. Electricity and water 24-7. I'm buying this house. Hmm? Stop processing my papers. Eh? Move it, move it. If you're living in Ghana and want an affordable and luxurious house to buy, look no further than Rehoboth Social Housing Limited. Oh. And to those from the diaspora, aren't you tired of living in places that doesn't belong to you? You can also own your house and be your own landlord from Rehoboth Social Housing Limited. I have my own, but also landlord. <laughs> Contact us now. Rehoboth Social Housing. Your housing dream becomes reality. Sometimes the unexpected happens and the hero falls down in his own story. But he needs not stay down for long. Cosmopolitan Health Insurance is your trusted health partner. Whether an individual building a business, with Cosmopolitan Health Insurance, your medical care is our concern. For the best health insurance solutions for corporate institutions, groups and associations, families and individuals, choose Cosmopolitan Health Insurance from our 
over 700 accredited health service providers nationwide. Call us on 0302-540-668 or 0501-678-547 for all your health insurance solutions. Cosmopolitan Health Insurance, your medical care is our concern. For over 20 years of serving the world with herbal and alternative medicine, we've been successful in treating complicated medical conditions with a perfect combination of herbal and alternative methods of treatments like homeopathy, naturopathy, reflexology, and many more. We deliver excellent and effective service to people from all walks of life through scientific and traditional means. We have a well-equipped laboratory with advanced diagnostic and treatment devices to help detect your illness so we know the right medication to be given. At Amen Scientific Herbal and Alternative Medical Hospital, we are proud manufacturers of our own herbal medication. Our zeal and passion to save lives with our patients at heart and outstanding achievements since 1996 has won us several awards. That is why we say, Go Herbal, Go Amen. We are located everywhere in all the regions. Amen Scientific Herbal and Alternative Medical Hospital. Allah Shafi, God is the healer. My son, there's more blessing in giving than receiving. The pneumatological abrasion of the Lord revealed unto me this night that me and my household should go out into the world and bless the world. Makers Electronics Company Limited am up to 67% discount. I was selected appliances as well. And did you break us this year? This is what I call quintessential immaculability. Jamu! She said the Makers Electronics Company Limited. I will tie for Burkina Highway. I'm a Samai Zongo Junction. I the K Pharmacy Dining. Oh, yeah, I'm a fat airman. Boga Junction. A shaman, Falco Flat, Kumasi, a Hinema Cocobain, a Safu Wachi Hospital Junction, Takradi, a few Kuma, number nine market. Go and tell mom and dad about the Maker's Blessing Attack program. From 0552 222 253 and 0552 222 254. Terms and conditions apply. The same in Gato Muna Messi. Right, welcome back to the show. If you just joined us, this is Good Morning Ghana Live on Metro TV. With me on the show this morning, I have uh, Felix Kwachiofus, who is a former Deputy Minister of Communications. Good morning, Felix. Oh, good morning, Randy. Also with me on the show this morning is Dr. Tia Abdul Kabiru Mahama, the Technical Advisor at the Office of the Vice uh, President. Uh, good morning, Doc. Good morning. Okay, I don't know how many... Uh, uh, Quranic quotations you have for us this morning. <laughs> Yesterday's uh, media review had three three quotations. Anyway, but um, <clears throat> well, I'm sure that um, as as young people, uh, we pray that um, God will grant uh, them a long life and that they will also grow to enjoy the fruits of their their, their labor. But of course. Um, Aging and physical infirmities are things that um, you can't do away with. And they have um, the, the, the ability of uh, preventing you from enjoying your homes, uh, mansions, and offices. And um, it often becomes challenging, if not impossible, to use the stairway day in and day out. But uh, you need not worry, because the American Pneumatic Vacuum Elevators, PVEs, are your sure bet for enjoying unlimited uh, uh, portions of your mansions and homes. It's simple to use a self-supported elevator for vertical movement of humans and goods 
at homes and the offices. So the original comes in three custom-made models with which uh, accessibility uh, to choose from. And you may call it luxury, but it's a necessary imperative for vertical mobility. And the good thing is that um, it can be installed at your already completed home where there are some little modifications. But um, I always advise that for the, those of you who are constructing at the moment, uh, please get in touch with Lift and Elevators Ghana at Sakumono uh, for free consultations on how this can be incorporated into the design of your home. And you can reach um, Elevators Ghana on 02005355150. 0053551 or email um, lift and elevators Ghana at um, elevators gh at gmail dot com. Right. Okay. So um, I've been asked to ask you a few questions. What does wealth mean to you? And uh, do you want to live like a tycoon? Uh, remember who's got the mola, got the power. Ghana's New West Lottery game draws live on Adom TV at 9 a.m., 12 p.m., and 6 p.m. daily. Now pick up your phones, tablets, and computers and download the Game Pack Games app on Play Store. You can also play on their website at www.gamepackgames.com or by dialing star 946 hash on all networks. Just choose four numbers from 0 to 9. Four numbers from 0 to 9. It's easy to play and easy to win. So as Charlie make we play this game and make some cash. Nobody beats our odds in Ghana. Game, pack games, more mola, more power. And this game is regulated by the National Lottery, Lottery Authority, not for persons under 18. Play responsibly. All right. So that's about it. So yesterday, um, in Parliament, the Finance Minister, um, presented the media review, which is a, <coughs> a legal requirement. All right, and like I told you, there were three Bible quotations. Uh, I, I, if you're interested, I'll probably find uh, those quotations for you. Uh, I, I don't remember them um, uh, readily because uh, I really didn't. Uh, anyway. <laughs> It really made me angry. Anyway, but uh, <laughs> let's find out what happened in Parliament. The minister first and then the minority. 2022 was the most difficult year for me as Ghana's finance minister. On July 1st, 2022, we took what was then a difficult but necessary decision to request support from the IMF to implement our post-COVID-19 program of economic growth. The country was going through a dire period of economic uncertainties and despondency. Mr. Speaker, we have turned the corner, and more importantly, we are determined to continue down that path. Soon, we expect the measures taking resulting in economic activity greater than anything experienced in the history of the Fourth Republic. Our plans and programs should soon lead to a sustained increase in domestic production, including manufacturing and farming, replacing many of the products that we are used to importing. Mr. Speaker, when I presented the 2023 budget in November last year, I indicated that we will pursue major fiscal and monetary policy measures within the framework of the PCPEG. Our coordinated response to the macro fiscal challenge charge us to develop in March 2022 before going to the IMF, that's the PC PEG. Mr. Speaker, we have turned the corner and more importantly, we are determined to continue down that path. Mr. Speaker, when I presented the 2023 budget in November last year, I indicated that we will pursue major fiscal and monetary policy measures within the framework of the PCPEG. Security continues to be a priority of government. The United Nations recently reported that over 1,800 terrorist attacks resulting in nearly 4,600 deaths were recorded in our West Africa region in the first six months of this year. Due to this instability, among others, increasing numbers of West African citizens are seeking refuge in our country. This has required 
a review of our security expenditures within the limited fiscal space. Security continues to be a priority of government. The United Nations recently reported that over the supported PCPEC has also prioritized social protection reforms to ensure that the vulnerable are protected from the impact of the ongoing fiscal adjustment. Social spending on health, social protection and education will be closely monitored to ensure timely disbursement of funds to beneficiaries. In addition, an indexation mechanism for benefits under the LEAP program will be put in place by end September 2023. The amount comprises receipts from the 63rd to the 68th liftings from the Jubilee Field, the 20th and 21st liftings from the 10 fields, and the 9th and 10th and 11th liftings from the Sankofa Jinyami Field. In addition to the total receipts for the year under review, petroleum receipts that spilled over from 2021 to 2022 was $14.82 million, bringing the total amount distributed to $1.44 billion. This compares to the amount distributed of $808.6 million for the same period in 2021. A total of $581.5 million was transferred into the Ghana Petroleum Funds 2022 compared to 227 million in 2021. Out of the amount transferred, the Ghana Heritage Fund received 174 million against 68 million in 2021, while the Ghana Civilization Fund received 407.06 million compared to 159.24 million in 2021. The eventual passage of all fiscal measures in the 2023 budget by the House and the completion of the DDEP program. I have also discussed the significant improvements in the key macroeconomic indicators, including inflation, exchange rate, interest rates, reserve position, growth rate, and the performance of the banks since 2022. Mr. Speaker, all these developments, together with the need to align with the targets of the IMS-supported PCPEC program, warrant a division to the macroeconomic framework. This was necessary because the framework was guided by the September 2022 data that underpinned the 2023 budget in November 2022. Are we good to go? Um, good afternoon. First, let me say that it is wrong for our minister responsible for finance to say that he has successfully turned the corner. That can never be the case. In fact, according to Adongo, he's not even close to the corner. What he has successfully done, indeed, is that he has deepened the woes of the ordinary Ghanaian. I say this for a simple reason. Because of certain factors that the statement has outlined. <coughs> First, he has revised economic growth from 2.8% of GDP to 1.5% of GDP. This clearly shows that the economy is contracting and it is declining and obviously is going to affect jobs and the welfare of the ordinary Ghanaian. Remember that in the year 2022, the overall GDP growth was 2.2%. He announced it was 3.1%. He announced in the 2023 budget in November, when he appeared before us, that the economy is expected to grow at 2.8%. I had indicated to him that with all what is happening in the economy, there is no way Ghana's economy can grow at 2.8%. Today, and finally, the chicken has come home to be roasted. He has informed us that the economy is going down and down, and to the extent that GDP growth is going to be 1.5% by the end of the year 2023. Even this, I have my doubt. Because looking at all what is happening, if care is not taken, we will struggle to see economic growth at above 1%. 
As if that is not enough, our minister today informed us. And again, in the 2022-2023 budget that was read in November, he indicated that he's not going to borrow from the domestic market at all. Zero financing from the domestic market. Sadly, today he has informed us that he has gone ahead without parliamentary approval and have borrowed from the T-bill market an amount of 5.5 billion Ghana cities. And as if that is not enough, he's going to borrow another 41.3 billion before the year ends. So colleagues, no wonder inflation is still going up and rising. No wonder that the central bank is busily increasing monetary policy rate. No wonder that lending rate is still going up. I wouldn't be surprised that at the end of the year, inflation will not make any headway. This is a gargantuan missed opportunity. Ghana had the opportunity to reduce lending rate downwards under 15%. Unfortunately, due to the activities of government, particularly the overborrowings and overexpenditure from government, Ghana's lending rate and market rates are still going up. TB rate not long ago was about 14%. Today we are doing about 23, 24, 25 we may end up in the 30s before the year ends. The third one has to do with the fact that he's saying that the city has stabilized. Our brothers and sisters from the media, the Ghana city has stabilized relatively because we have defaulted in the payment of our external debt. If you were to look into the budget, by this time, we should have serviced our debt, external debt, approximately 11 billion Ghana cities. Because we have defaulted in servicing our debt owned to Eurobond lenders, China, Saudi Arabia, India, UK, Japan, France, Czech Republic, and many more countries. I don't know of Togo, but it could be that we owe them. But because we owe all these countries and because we have failed to service this debt, we have made some savings that is supporting our balance of payment. It is not because he has turned the corner. By the end of the year, as early as January 2024, we will start servicing this debt. And if we are to start servicing this debt, don't be surprised that our currency, the city, will start depreciating once again. So it is not true that they have turned the corner. Mm -hmm. They have rather deepened our woes. This is just the foundation. My colleague and the ranking member, Honorable Adongo, will speak and then make some comment as the ranking member of the Finance Committee of mm -hmm. Ghana's Parliament. And tomorrow, we urge the people of Ghana and all of you to pay attention to what we will say, starting the debate on the media review. I think we've missed a golden opportunity to turn around our economy. We are rather messed you up as the people of Ghana. And this has been superintended by Mr. Strategist, the Vice President. Thank you very much. Uh, we all listen to the funeral dead. At some point, I had to wake up and ask them to wake up from sleep and listen to the man. So when they finally got up and said, yeah, yeah, they were sleeping. So I was surprised when they suddenly woke up, they were shouting when they hadn't heard the man speaking. But like my leader said, the finance minister says he has turned the corner. You have turned the corner when inflation is 42%. Is that the corner? You have turned the corner when you are reporting that even by the end of the year, your reserves will only be 0 0.8% months. That is less than one month of reserves at the Bank of Ghana. And you said that is turning the corner. You have turned the corner when the governor and the MPC just recently increased monetary policy rate to 30 percent. You have turned the corner when the Bank of Ghana has reported that the city has depreciated by 30 percent. 
So quite clearly, he is not even near the corner, let alone to turn it. You have turned the corner when your central bank, the Bank of Ghana, has actually recorded negative reserves at the Bank of Ghana to the tune of 70 billion Ghana cities. That is the total borrowing. But our reserve position at the Bank of Ghana today is negative 70 billion. What it means is that all the monies in our banks that they force them to save with the Bank of Ghana that we call prudential reserves, Sikanashi, Bank of Ghana has wasted all that money. All the monies they've been borrowing from abroad in foreign currency to support the city is gone. As a matter of fact, if you even take away government debt that they have impaired of 48 billion, you will see, see that the Bank of Ghana has a whole of 22 billion. So it is not government. And you come here and say you have turned the corner. What this means is that the Bank of Ghana itself, as we speak, is not fit for purpose. Because Bank of Ghana, as we speak today, cannot undertake monetary policy without printing money, because it doesn't have money. And yet you say you have turned the corner. Tomorrow we will tell him whether he's even on site. But today this is just on the surface. But you know they released the Bank of Ghana auditor report on Friday, hoping that Saturday, Sunday we'll be attending funerals and churches. And then Monday, Ken Oforiata will take our attention away. Tell the governor, after tomorrow, we are back to the Bank of Ghana audit report. Thank you very much. So, so, so we boxed ourselves into a corner. The finance minister says that we're out of that corner. We're turning, making a turn on the corner. The, the minority says that um, they don't even think that we're on site to even um, get out of that hole and all that. Dr. Tia, help me understand what is going on. Thank you very much, and mm. uh, good morning, Doc. Mm. Mm. And then uh, maybe before I just stay, mm. uh, I'd probably try to explain to the understanding of the I hope the you are not coming to Ghanaians. recite the Quran. I want to... <laughs> I want to say good morning. Two of my friends joined okay. the club yes, uh, last weekend. Okay. Uh, they are now in the doctoral club. Oh, okay. So, uh, Dr. Mark Effort uh, Adade is the head of accounts at the Controller uh, General Department. Wow, congratulations. And then, uh, Dr. Dennis Chi Bochi with the Registrar General. Whoa. They are two friends of mine, and uh, I miss the, the, the program. The function, okay. But I hope to join them in the party. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Look, on, on you, were, you were turning the corner, so you couldn't <laughs> make it. Anyway, yeah, so congratulations. Their names once again. Yeah, Dennis Cheboche, Registrar General. Registrar General. And then uh, Mr. Mark Effort Adade. Okay, so yeah. Dr. Mark Adade, Accountant General, right? Yeah. And then Dr. Boche, yeah. uh, Registrar General of the Department. And congratulations, uh, uh, Docs. <laughs> and. Uh, 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 you're welcome to uh, Dr. Tia's uh, <laughs> a group. Uh, yeah, mm. Your group as well. <laughs> <laughs> yes, okay, Doc, so, so, doc the, the, the final minister, as you gave in your introduction, mm. performed a statutory duty right. in line with uh, Section 28.1 of the PFM Act, Act 921. Mm. The final minister is required and joined by the, by the law to present to Parliament before or latest by the 31st mm. of July a media uh, fiscal policy review, highlighting what has been achieved and the way forward towards the end of the year. This year presentation, the Vice Minister did basically three things to give us an update of the micro fiscal position of the country and the uh, economic development or recent update on the economic development. The Vice Minister also updated us because we are in an, we are we are having an, an IMF program. The Vice Minister also updated us on the progress we are making towards achieving some of the structural benchmarks, some of the quantitative performance criteria and the indicative targets. The finance minister then also gave us an idea of the growth path that the government intend to achieve. So basically, this was the objective. However, we know that where they need be, where appropriate, the finance minister will submit a supplementary budget. This year, uh, the finance minister did not present any supplementary budget because in his view, and based on the update, that he had given, 
expenditure was within appropriation, in fact, far less, uh, lesser than the appropriated uh, as approved by Parliament. So, therefore, there was no need for government to request, and that would require that Parliament should approve thereof of any supplementary budget. The finance minister first gave us an update. That is where the minority have issue on, on the performance, macro fiscal position. You see, the health of the economy is measured by how these micro indicators, fiscal indicators, are faring. So first, he gave us an idea of our fiscal balance, noting that half year we have done a fiscal uh, primary balance of 1.2%, which is far, 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 far outside the target. In fact, we have performed more than the target we have set for ourselves for the half year of, uh, of and then he again signaled that moving into the end of the year, we are likely to have a fiscal primary balance of negative 0.5. Now, imagine an economy that did a primary balance, surplus of over 3% or about 3% last year. You are trying to reduce it to something like 0.5. That is more than 2 percentage point reduction. It requires steep cut in expenditure which means that government has to introduce very austere measures. Government has to increase revenue raking in measures. Government has to control expenditure in order to achieve such fit. So the federal minister already doing 1.2% in the first half year of, of, of 2023 means that the federal minister is working, or the, the managers of the economy are working seriously to stabilize the economy. The government also noted that on the revenue side, we have performed less our target by some $9 billion. Because at the time the budget was prepared, you use your oil revenue around $88 per barrel. And now into the year, you are doing something like 70%, 74%. Virtually, your revenue will not come as expected. But the good news is that we have performed about 39% in revenue improvement in the non-oil sector. That is, we are generating more revenue. Some $42 billion in additional revenue has been raked in through this non-formal, I mean, non-oil, uh, uh, if you like, uh, revenue handles. So that is the positive part, because if your economy is dependent on natural resources, any volatility in the oil, I mean, in the commodity market is likely to affect your, your performance and is going to affect your macroeconomic indicator. So when government is performing in non-oil sector, it is something positive for the economy. The, the, the finance minister also, again, on the, on the micro fiscal side, noted that inflation is stabilizing. December, when we had the, the, the height of the problem, we were doing an inflation rate of around 54%. Now, we are experiencing the heat at a far reduced, uh, what do you call it, degrees or Celsius, if you like. Because if you were having an inflation rate of 54% and government is working to reduce it, even 42% is not yet acceptable. And the finance minister will be the first person to admit that doing an inflation rate of 42% is not something to celebrate. But it is a testament that there is on a path to recovery. Because something 54 and you bring it to 42 and you are still working to reduce the further is something positive. The finance minister also... You're not, you're not, Doc, you're not... Um, what's it, so what does this mean? That, um, let's say, for example, in the month of May, uh, it dipped down to some... 41 or so, and then in June, it went up 42. So what it means is that if it were a graph, you had this and then that, yeah. which presupposes that um, it is not on the tangent that you want. Something must have triggered yeah. it. Yes. Yeah, so, you know, inflation like exchange rate are very sensitive. And any shock is likely to feed in into the figures you have. So, for instance, if you have a particular month that you see that your exchange rate depreciation is not is 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 moving up, okay, you are likely to have the inflation rate also going in the same direction. So, because of the 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 the, the positive correlation of these two, I mean, important variables, anytime you find your inflation, your currency depreciating, and you realize that within that particular period, we had experienced some pressure on the Ghana CD also going a bit high. So, that accounts for it. Government will have to simultaneously uh, monitor uh, exchange rate at the same time inflation. While the real sector is what we are, government has a responsibility of working on, the monetary sector is what the, uh, the, 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 the Bank of Ghana is working on. And you also realize whenever the inflation rate is not 
the slowdown in inflation is not accepted. The, the central bank tightened up the monetary policy. You see, and they are all working to ensuring that we have the economy, the heat on the economy uh, being stabilized. Mm -hmm. So apart from that, we had a situation of the exchange rate. Look, you recall that sometime in November last year, we did about 54% depreciation of our, our, of our currency. Ended the year about 30%. Year to date, we are having about 22% depreciation. Never in our period, and I've always mentioned that, that when you are, the structure of the economy is such that it is highly commodity based, it is not it's so much informal, it is difficult for you to compete in terms of currency trading with any other of the major currencies, especially when you have a vehicle currency like the USA dollar, the pound sterling. So when government is able to monitor, is able to manage, and the pace of depreciation of your currency within a year is anything 20% or lesser, you would tap yourself on the back and say you are preferred. Even though it is not the ideal situation because you will prefer your currency to match favorable with any other currency. But if Ghanaian city is, Ghana is the only country that trades in the Ghanaian city, our economy is so small. So we don't expect, and it is so difficult, until the time that we are able to export more, then we import, we don't expect that our currency will perform that aggressively and will appreciate all the time against the major currency. So when the finance ministry is able to manage the currency and we are able to have a slowdown in the depreciation, it is something showing resilience, it is showing recovery, and it is something positive the finance minister has to highlight. Sh shouldn't we, look, on, on, on that score, shouldn't we be interested in, because... Um, um, economic management is not uh, voodoo, it's not magic. Mm -hmm. um, it is something that can be attributed to particular interventions, particular policies, particular strategies. And so if we have some stability um, in terms of, or a reduction in terms of the depreciation of a currency, it must be attributable to something or a set of things that have been done. Yeah. I mean, you heard the, you, 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 you watch the minority say that is attributable to the fact that we are defaulting and therefore interest payments that we should have made. For example, some 11 billion for external, we are not doing, we are not making those, those payments. And so that is what, um, um, can be attributed to, to this, this thing and not um, about any, um, um, any serious strategy, unless we want to say that a default is also an economic strategy. Yeah, so Doc, yeah. you see, the, their argument is valid on the surface. But yeah. if you look closely, a casual look, you just attribute it to what they are saying. Mm -hmm. Truth be told, when you don't have pressure from payment of your debt obligation, Especially when most of them have, I mean, half of your I mean, loan is dollar denominated, you will expect that the pressure on your currency will not be as expected. But the counter question you will ask the minority is that were we having default in the payment when our situation was stabilizing towards the end of the year? The question is no. Mm -hmm. We had done from, we have removed from 54% to 30% 30 30 end year without default in payment like the moratorium on the payment of external obligation. Mm. Something was being done. So I'm not denying the fact that when you are not paying your debt obligation, there's no, the pressure on your CD would, would reduce. Okay, but that is, to subscribe the, the whole picture to that situation is also not to be true to the fact. Mm. One of the pressures is that, okay, we have 600 million also hitting our account. Mm. It is also contributing to the, to, the, to the slowdown in the depreciation. Mm. We also have in the situation that where we are for the period, we are, our, our, our trade, our, our, our current account is showing positive. Mm. It means that we are exporting more than we are importing. That is something that reduces the pressure on the Ghanaian CD and makes sure that our CD is able to perform favorably with the dollar. Mm. Aside this, we also have a situation where our import, oil imports, was taking a chunk of our foreign reserves. Mm -hmm. Then we have the Go for Oil program mm -hmm. that is actually moderating how much we spend mm -hmm. in terms of the importation of this uh, oil product in the country. That is also contributing. Mm -hmm. All these are part of, I mean, measures government are putting, except the fact that you say, and even the decision 
to go for a debt suspension or debt standstill is a measure, especially mm -hmm. when you are in crisis. People will think that it is not rocket science. But even the decision, one, the ability to negotiate, to, to convince them to accept your terms, are all part of the duty of government to do. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, why would someone be, why, I mean, some countries have started these processes and they've not been able to achieve any results. Mm -hmm. So the fact that your leaders have been able to achieve such a height, we may see that, look, the, 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 only thing, the only thing is that we don't have a decision on our external debt yet. Yes, yes. yes. I mean, um, that when the finance minister also mentioned that, in fact, there was also the fourth angle he mentioned that the update on the debt exchange program or debt restructuring, and that we had, we had uh, but, you know, more importantly, when you look at our external debt component, it is much more certain than the, in the, the domestic. Mm -hmm. But as policy people, we are also careful that we don't spoke the market outside because what happens within your economy would also tell them that how you are treating your domestic uh, instrument holders mm. would also inform us of how we behave towards you. Mm. So government has not brought finality into the debt restructuring. So our debt sustainability measures are not exhaustive yet. Mm. Now, on the issue of growth, which the finance minister mentioned, we had performed in the first quarter about 4% growth. But the finance minister was very candid in line with the IMF projection, in line with global development that will end the year with 1.5 percentage growth. Why? Simple fact is that one, oil prices, which is one of the major drivers of our economic growth, our volumes are not as much. Also, the prices are coming down. Mm -hmm. So you don't expect your economy to be of that magnitude. Two, the development in the Mediterranean Sea and the blockage, which has been not even the government that is subscribing the IMF own report. And the World Bank all report saying that the continual blockage of the Black Sea by Russia on the back of the Ukraine-Russia war is going to have further toll on economies. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if the finance minister is looking at all the, this development and revising the, the growth ground, mm -hmm. people should not just say that, look, the finance minister has mismanaged the economy. It is quite easy for him to say that we end the year with 4%. Mm -hmm. But if we don't meet it, it doesn't inject confidence in the Ghanaian economy. So apart from growth, the finance minister, when we, I mean, after the macro-fiscal development update, he also gave us an update on the IMF program. And I'm saying that, look, the 2023 budget was one of the prior actions for the IMF program. Because we had the PCPEC part of the budget, and that PCPEC, that's a post-COVID-19 program for economic uh, growth, was what the IMF gave their decision on and approve the fund program for us. Now, the finance minister gave us an update on that. And he was quite clear that almost all the structural benchmarks that were the basis for the program and that were included as part of the IMF, more or less, if you like, conditionalities, we are on the course of meeting them. For instance, our updated energy sector recovery, preparation and then approval of our updated energy sector recovery plan. Secondly was our plan on a areas clearance and prevention. The third one was our, our, about our, our, if I can quickly recall, the third structure benchmark we had to do with was to finalize our, uh, our stock of payable accumulated areas and finalize our financial sector strengthening strategy. That was the third document. These documents have been prepared and approved by cabinet awaiting the assessment by the, by the IMF. He was also quick to add that six of the quantitative performance criteria were on the course of I mean, meeting them. And we are not in the position to declare whether government has met or government has failed. It is the assessment that's going to determine that. So government is putting in place measures. And our view is that we are doing everything to tick these boxes before the farm program. Because mind you, the release of the subsequent $600 million dollars and further releases are going to be based on the performance of government in terms of these quantitative uh, criteria. Government has also noted that one out of the three indicative targets have been achieved, which is something positive for, for government. And moving into June, or I mean into September, where they will come in for the assessment, we are quite sure that government will have met most of these targets. In fact, all quantitative targets will have been met, almost all of the indicative targets will have met, and structural benchmarks will have been met. That is something government is coming. Because we know to do this, government has to work extra hard. 
And if government is doing this and, and someone says that government is not turning the corner, I wonder what the corner is. That they, and maybe probably they have a different corner from what was set up in the 2023 budget and what was contained in the IMF program and what the finance minister presented in, I mean, yesterday. Mm -hmm. Now, let me also talk briefly about the, the, the finance minister's uh, talk about the revision. You see, government would have to be candid to the, to the people of Ghana. Government would have to present budget that signals confidence. Government will have to make sure that there's certainty and predictability in terms of investors, I, I mean, willingness and readiness to invest in your economy. And if you present a budget that does not adequately carry the people, the, invest, the investor community along, they will not invest. And it's going to create huge problems for you moving further. So that's why when you see a government revising growth figures down, government actually saying that we'll do a negative private balance, it is not to suggest that government is not, I mean, to, to paint, you don't use those figures to paint a bad picture about government. You rather take those particular pictures and look at where were we when you ended a, a previous year with primary balance, I mean, deficit of one, three, over 3%. Three now you are doing a year of 0 0.5, which is actually very much in line with the IMF target of fiscal, I mean, uh, primary balance deficit. You would be happy. You commend yourself. You think that government is actually working and government is turning around. So briefly, this presentation is one that signals like, look, our economy is resilient, it's getting res more resilient. We are on a path of recovery because most of our indicators, which were going south, are now on the, on the positive note. They are moving towards the direction government wants the indicators to go. Government is raking in more revenue from non-oil sources, which is positive, a 39.7% increment in non-tax uh, uh, measures or revenue handle is something significant and the GRA has really shown that they can actually do more than uh, we, 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 we expect them to do. Oil revenue is dipping. It is something that government has no control over because global dynamics, supply and demand in the global market determines the oil prices. It is something government is aware of and it's a risk factor government has acknowledged that in the budget. Government has also noted that the energy sector which is part of the last bit of the debt restructuring program, is still a risk around the neck of government. Government is working seriously to ensuring that we achieve this. But we must be comment government on the issue of supplementary budget. Look, we've been, there's, there's been this argument that government is not, if you like, rational in this expenditure. Government is not cutting down as well. There's this I mean, wanting dissipation of, I mean, countering resources. Government is not sensitive. And government, is, all these arguments come. But I will say that the proof of government fiscal discipline is in the numbers. Okay? If for the first half year, government has done 1.2% positive problem balance, what it essentially tells you is that government it is controlling expenditure more than, I mean, and raking in more revenue. That is the simple meaning of that. There's no better measure of government containment of expenditure than that. So this argument of, I think that this budget for the last time and for the first time again, also buried the argument that government is not rational with the expenditure. Government is having on, 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 on unnecessary expenditure. And if you look at the numbers, and I'm, I'm so, so surprised that in all the commentary of the minority, they have gleaned over that particular performance of government in terms of the... And the importance of the primary balance is that you know, when you have large debt-to-GDP ratio and you are measuring your performance using the physical primary balance on commitment basis, on commitment basis, you are basically telling people that, look, the stock of debt accumulation, the piling up of debt and your ability to pay them and your fiscal I mean, sustainability analysis are actually moving in the right direction. And that's something that I think that government has to be commended for, that government is containing expenditure, government is doing everything to cut down, uh, what you call it, wasteful expenditure and to ensure that the money is put into good use. Lastly, the, the finance minister also mentioned about the growth strategy. And that is where I think that the whole program of the IMF is based on. We are doing promoting growth at the same time, protecting the vulnerable. And you realize that the finance minister mentioned in his presentation that social expenditure has been expanded. 
lead payment has been expanded or has been enhanced. We have school feeding program also enhanced. Capitation grant has also been In fact, as part of the IMF conditionality, we must meet certain expenditure targets of, of cumulatively before they will tell that you are spending. It means that it is required that government is doing everything possible to ensure that the economy is turned around. We will have up to 2028 where things will have returned number. If you were doing... 20 what? 2028. Okay. Where the situation would have, would have bounced back to our normal projection that the pre-COVID growth figures of 7%, 6.7%, I mean 6% 6, uh, 6 growth rate. Okay. That is the projection government is having. But we will need to take the tough decisions now. And government is taking those tough decisions now. I just hope and pray that the presentation out there would be construed within the context. Because imagine the time that we had this huge catastrophe of a COVID, okay, and schools had to close down, government had to do everything to protect life. Imagine putting all that into the picture. You cannot, by any stretch of the imagination, think that this government is reckless. Unless, of course, of course, for propaganda, for politics, for the, for the fact that there is an alternative that wants to replace the carers, I mean, regime, all those arguments will be allowed. But if you put everything in the basket, if you analyze and, the, and put away the personality of Nana Akufuadu, put away Dr. Mahmoud Baumia, put away Ken Oforiata, and just want to analyze the issue dispassionately, you will come to no other conclusion that government was faced with a disaster, a disaster that has never been experienced by any country, and even this country included. That disaster meant that we had to do everything possible to salvage the fortunes of the Ghanaian people. Government did everything possible to save the situation. But what do you say to those who say that that disaster gave you 30 billion? Yes, but those people have not averted their amount to what expenditure has that disaster cost. Yeah. Increment in the salary the, of teachers. The finance minister told us how much of that 30 billion went to COVID-related expenditure and how much was used for budgetary support. Exactly. And budgetary support had more than COVID expenditure. Exactly. But so, what people so why always do you, forget... Why do you, why why people do you always, paint the pandemic as... No, no. What people forget yes. is that the pandemic has dipped our re revenues. Your borders were closed. Mm -hmm. Okay. The revenue you were going to get from it, you are not getting it. Okay. Mm -hmm. That would have been money that come to support the budget. But you are not getting it. Now, people always look at the direct expenditure to COVID... They don't look at the consequential effect of the yeah. COVID in the other aspect of the economy. So it's because when you're also speaking about COVID, you also speak about the expenditure related to COVID, the losses. And you do not speak about the fact that never in the history of the world has a pandemic given you 30 billion cities. If you do the net, if you do the yeah. netting, you yes. realize that government was at a loss. It's not at, government did not make any money. From if you put everything, government did not make any money from COVID. Okay. And I've always insisted that but people will always look at the money that has been received mm. only directly. And the money that has been spent directly on COVID and say COVID alone gave you 30 billion. Yes. But they forget that COVID might have caused you a revenue losses of say 20 billion. Your direct expenditure of say 15 billion. No, government you, is, have the, you have the data. So no, I have the data, but because we didn't. You no, know, you don't get what I'm saying. Yes. I'm saying that that data is available. Yes. What government expected to get. And what he got, yeah. and what the difference was. Yes. So this one, book no lie, it is not something that should even be subject to an argument. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So that's what I'm saying. That, but because the analysis usually we don't factor that into the argument. Both parties, mm. we always. Lose I would not have asked you a question yeah. if you had factored both. Of, of course, uh, right now you, that, that <laughs> question has given me the opportunity to explain that people are, we always get it wrong. One, we always look at the COVID money we receive and right. you don't factor in all the consequential effect of right. COVID in terms of right. our revenue, in terms of direct expenditure, right. in terms of, and even people say government has introduced more tax measures, yes. about 10 revenue measures, yes. and they forget that, look, VAT alone, VAT alone, what we're expecting to get is, is just equivalent to what, of 30% increment in salary. Mm. Okay, mm. so but when people are is going to analyze, they we, are, say, we are still paying a COVID levy. Yeah, people, when people are going to analyze, they will just say that look, you are you've introduced that, mm. but if they will forget, mm. whether conveniently or out of, I mean, uh, 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 either ignorance or genuine forgetfulness, mm. 
they will not look at what you are done, you, are, you have done in the in the other aspect of I mean the 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 welfare or wages and compensation. Mm. So basically, this was a situation. Mm. I will just again urge that we will need to support the government in terms in this particular period. Government has shown and has demonstrated that if we are able to get the energy sector very right, if we are able to get our new revenue measures which are yielding results of thirty nine point seven percent. If we are able to, I mean, if oil prices are able to stabilize, we may even be able to do more than 1.5 percent mm. growth that we are expecting. Mm. But that said, government needs to be conservative and put their growth at that particular percent. Right. Okay. So, 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 um, uh, a man who's uh, going to become a, going to have the title doctor very soon, an end one, as 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 um, I should put it. Uh, he's a politician. He sent us this. Uh, the current account has a debt service component. That is interest payment. Whilst amortization is found under the capital accounts, we are not paying both as we speak. So the currency will artificially stabilize. You agree? You agree? We, it says the current account has a debt service component. Mm -hmm. That is interest payment. Whilst amortization is found under the capital accounts, mm -hmm. we are not paying both as we speak. So the currency will artificially stabilize. Of course, I mean, okay. it's not even that the currency would stabilize. It's not mm. an first stabilization. Mm. Because we are for that. It's not an artificial because when you start paying, then. Mm. Yeah. Of, of course, but it's again, we have to. So when we are, we are holding constant that our trade will not perform, mm. we are holding constant that government will not be able to, you know, uh, uh, if you like, control. Mm. In fact, the positive thing is that we are not even contracting more loans outside, I mean, dollar denominated loan on the back of the IMF program. Mm. Even the program has put out 66 million. That even any state enterprises or government wants to go, you shouldn't go beyond 66 million or so. Mm. It is in the IMF program. But we are borrowing like crazy on the treasury bill market. But, dog, government mm. has to finance No, I'm not saying, I'm just stating a fact. Okay. I'm not saying there's no reason. Okay, so <laughs> and, and when you say government is proving crazy, but also so oh yeah, admit. the figures are alarming. <laughs> it's the only reason why there's no haircut on treasury bills because that's where you go every day. Anyway, so this is from uh, the Honorable John Jinapo, mm. uh, soon to be doctor. But I thought he was going to be here today. Uh, so what happened? I never knew about him. Oh, okay. Him coming here. I never knew. Yeah, I've missed him. It's uh, the last okay. time. Okay, my all senior, right. my senior. So okay, all right. Okay, we'll see if next week I can. Uh, uh, get you both of you here. So we'll take a break. When we return, we'll take um, Felix's perspectives on this. Uh, I tend to, to have an inclination of how it's going to turn the corner. We'll be back shortly. Enjoy the fruits of your labor, they say. But as humans, aging and physical infirmity stands our way of enjoying our mansions and homes. It often becomes challenging, if not impossible, to use our stairways day in, day out. With portable American pneumatic vacuum elevators, PVEs, you are assured of unlimited enjoyment of your mansions and homes. It's a self-supported elevator for vertical movement of humans and goods at homes and offices. The original comes in three custom-made models with wheelchair accessibility call it luxury but it's a necessary imperative for vertical mobility do not let aging or infirmity limit you get one for your easy vertical mobility at home it's affordable and can be installed in just three days without modification to your existing building it's however easier to incorporate it at the construction stage we also have traditional fuji elevators and escalators for your high-rise buildings and malls visit lifts and elevators company limited at sakumono for your elevators nationwide for free consultation to call or whatsapp us on 0200-535-515 lifts and elevators the elevator people hello my name is Soveya Mushofa Yahaya I'm a property consultant with Val Real Estate Ghana Val Real Estate will be at the Mikasa Home and Property Fair 2023 as Plantnum sponsors for the second time running as a multinational real estate developer we have our footprint in Turkey, Kenya, Ghana, and recently, Uganda. We are the developers of Harmonia Residence, which is a 17-story mixed-use residential complex situated at Airport West, and Harmonia Villas, which comprises of eight units, five-bedroom townhouses situated in Cantonment, 
We invite you to come learn more about our projects and explore endless possibilities with us. Join us at the Moving Peak Ambassador Hotel on the 5th and 6th of August from 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. daily. It's absolutely free to enter. JA Plant Food Ghana Limited has introduced the all new Jetto X70 Plus to the market. your business and private printing need successfully we have just the right products and services at appointed time printing limited we specialize in digital printing offset printing packaging and security printing our innovative designs and complete professional touch on our print products such as posters flyers brochures magazines all cards and any other print solution of your choice ensure that our customers are always happily connected to their audience with our security printing section our clients are assured of a highly secured and confidential work process from start to finish at a point in time our prices are very very competitive locators at the old gntc building near swansea shopping arcade Accra. contact us on 0501 0501454167 Appointed Time Printing Limited, our printing assistant. Right, welcome back to the show. If you just joined us, this is Good Morning Ghana Live on Metro TV. Still with me on the show, I have uh, the Honorable Felix Kwachi Ufusu and uh, Dr. Uh, Tia Kabiru Mahama. Now, uh, times are, are hard. They are actually hard. And um, whether you're in the corner, you're turning the corner, you're on site or off site, um, the Makers Electronics Company Limited has some good news for you. Uh, they have up to about 67% discount on selected appliances from brands such as Samsung, LG, Move, Nasco, TCL Media, and Toshiba. Uh, you can get quality but affordable uh, electronic appliances with two years manufacturer def defect warranty from their showrooms at Taifa, Burkina Highway, Amasaman, Zongo Junction, Oyarifa, Teman, Boga Junction, Kaswa, Newmarket, Ashaman, Valko Flat, Kumasi, Ahinima, Kokobin, Takradi, Fikuma, Number 9 Market. You can reach them on 055 Two 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 five three or zero five five two 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 five 
for the Makers Electronics Company Limited, large and in charge with quality but affordable home appliances and consumer electronics. Terms and conditions apply. And so uh, we're getting ready for the European season, uh, the European uh, football uh, seasons. And uh, they say that it's not by mouth, it's by play. Don't be blue, wear your crown of glory and come slug it out as citizens at the IMG League Cup. It's a club fan based tournament. So whether you are a gun blazing Ghana, uh, or a fan of the old ladies, or you're a fan of uh, Liverpool, the IMG League Cup is made for you. This is to set a tone for the new Euro League's season. So come join us on the 5th of August at Ajiring and Astro Theft Park for the best of goals and bragging rights. Remember, it's the 5th of August. That's next Saturday at Ajiring and Astro Theft Park. Don't miss it. And this is sponsored by Game Park Games. Simply dial star 946 hash on all networks. And this is a 2023 IMG League Cup. All right. Randy? Yes. Uh, so, some people claim to have turned a certain corner. Mm. I'm not sure which corner it is, whether it is a corner, you know, Mamma's corner or corner stone. Mm. Which corner is that the idea referring to? When I was Randy? a kid, we used to play four corners. Four corners, is that yes. mm. You see, Randy, um, I had a lecture once I was at Kea University, mm -hmm. uh, Professor Adai, and he mm. used to tell us constantly that one of his cardinal principles in life is that whenever he sets off to do something, he has the end in mind. Mm -hmm. So you always admonish us to have the end in mind mm -hmm. at the beginning. Mm -hmm. So I will tell you my conclusion mm -hmm. before I delve into the substance of my submission. Okay. The MPP has been a spectacular failure mm -hmm. in the management of the economy, period. Mm -hmm. There is no explanation. It doesn't matter what corner they refer to, whether it's four corners, eight corners, 13 corners. Mm. You see, and I say they have been a spectacular failure, or I draw that conclusion, based purely on fact. It is not conjecture. It is not my gut feeling. It is what actually exists on paper and on the ground. Because you see, you cannot assess the MPP's performance on the economy without pitching the outcomes against what they promised. That is the only way that you can do an analysis as to whether or not they have done well. Randy, before the MPP came to power, they made specific commitments to the people of Ghana on the subject of the economy. And as I've always indicated, Ghanaians did not queue up to vote for President Akufuado so that Alaji Mahamia would become his vice president because they thought that they were better looking than President Mama and the late Emisata. That was not the reason why Ghanaians woke up at dawn to go and queue to vote for them. They voted for them because they made promises. They told them that they would do specific things in their interest once they get power. So any analysis at any juncture of the MPP's performance must be based on what we heard them say. Now, even if we were to overlook the commitments they made on platforms, which themselves are binding, mm. and stick to what they documented by way of their manifesto, there's absolutely no way that anybody can say that the MPP has done even remotely well. Look, when it comes to the economy, the, the thrust of the MPP's commitments in their 2016 manifesto, because that ultimately is what brought them to power, is contained on page 13, paragraph 4. It's just one paragraph. And I'm going to read to you key elements within that paragraph. You see, they committed themselves, what they promised to do the following. They said that they will ensure double-digit growth annually means that every year they will grow this economy above 10%. When we were making this promise, right, nobody held a cudgel over their heads. They said so willingly based on their knowledge of the Ghanaian economy because in that manifesto, they analyzed the Ghanaian economy. And I've always told you that these days, it is, it is not possible to hide much about the Ghanaian economy because of the reporting standards. And in an era where we deal intermittently with the IMF and other international bodies, you simply cannot hide figures. Even if you hide them, you will be exposed eventually, as we've done in the case of the deficits that they've been trying to hide over the years. So this, they knew what economy they were going to take over, and they made these commitments. Right? They also told us that they were going to reduce the cost of doing business. And the things that you look at to see whether that has been done, you look at taxes, because that's what affects businesses. You look at the exchange rates, its fluctuations, where it is now or where it was before. And then you look at interest rates. 
In some instances, you also look at inflation. Randy, they said they would maintain fiscal discipline. And there are two ways, there are two key ways you assess whether there's fiscal discipline. You look at the deficit, the fiscal deficit, which is the difference between your revenue and expenditure. And then you look at your primary balance, which essentially is the fiscal deficit minus interest payments. Because essentially, it is about how much you earn and how much you spend. That is what fiscal discipline is about. And they said that they will reduce government borrowing. In other words, the rates at which we borrowed, or the level of borrowing was too much. And so they will reduce it. What it means is that they would either maintain the pace, or they will go lower than us. And then they specifically said that they will reduce interest rates. So any analysis that we do of the NDP's performance in the managers of the economy must be set within this framework. If they are able to pass these tests, these benchmarks, then they have done well. If they are unable to meet them, they have failed. And as I've always said, when you fail, you are booted out, you are not promoted. Right, so let's look at the claim on the double digit growth. In fact, the finance minister himself admitted that 2020 has been his worst year. So what 2022. 2022. So what you would refer to in Latin as annals for rebellion, a horrible year. Randy, when did he presented the budget in November 2022, last year. Or 2021, I beg your pardon. He said that they were going to grow at 3.7%. His reports, as presented yesterday, of the final outtens for 2022, which was presented in April, is 3.1 percent. Randy, look at the gulf between the promise to grow this economy at 10 percent annually and outcomes hovering around 3.1 percent. Randy they told us that they were going to achieve inflation of 28.5 percent in 2022. By the time December came to an end, inflation was 54%. Mind you, they had promised that they were going to keep inflation low. And the total revenue and grants, that one, they almost met it. They projected that they would get 96.7 billion. No, no, they got 96.7 billion, but they projected to get 96.84 billion, which is less than 10 million Ghana city difference. Total expenditure. They said they will spend 133.8 billion. Right? They spent 165.1 billion. So that raises the issue of fiscal discipline. Have they kept within the expenditure framework that they set up for the 2022 budget? And the overall budget deficit. Again, fiscal discipline, which they promised. They achieved overall budget deficit of 11.8% of GDP. Randy, that means what that did they project? Oh, they projected, uh, just a minute, they projected 6.3%. And they made what? They made 11.8%. Randy, that means that for three years running, they have run double digit deficits. For three years running, double digit deficits. Meanwhile, you promised, stood before the people of Ghana, put your hand on your heart, and said that you maintain fiscal discipline by having a reduced budget deficit. And my brother kept going on and on about the primary balance. Randy, they promised that they would do a primary balance deficit of 0.7%. They did 4.3%. It means that even if you took out interest payments, regular expenditure alone exceeded revenue by 4.3% of GDP. So the promise to maintain fiscal discipline also has been failed. When they said they will reduce government borrowing. At the time, government borrowing stood at 120 billion Ghana cities. End period 2016. Today, even if they hide debts owed by SOEs, uh, special purpose vehicles, the public debt as of the end of 2022 was around 500 billion Ghana cities. So on the issue of reducing borrowing to they have failed. Around the gross international reserves, gross international reserves, they said that they had 2.7 months of import cover. And that is just gross because they are incumbent funds. They are funds that are only sitting there for a brief period. Mm. Basically, they use it to garnish their accounts. 
But once those funds leave, you look at the net. Yes, the finance minister disclosed that as we speak, our net international reserves is 0.8% of import cover. Less than a month. Less than a month. So on all available metrics, Randy, they have failed. There's not one metric that they've been able to achieve. There's not one promise that they've been able to achieve. Randy, but how did we come to this juncture? And that is where my brother attempted to make excuses, claiming that there is some blockade not allowing ships to move to and fro. There's COVID, there's war, there's everything. The, about the only thing that he's not said there is are the 10 places that afflicted Egypt in biblical times. Randy, but which country in this world did not suffer from COVID? Do you know of any country that did not suffer from COVID? Indeed, there are countries in which up to 1 million people died from COVID infections. 1 million people. At a point in places like Italy and the US, people were dying in their hundreds, thousands daily. All West African countries suffered from COVID. And yet, there is not one country in West Africa that has these horrible economic outcomes. So the COVID excuse is still, it no longer makes sense in the analysis. Because if it were the case that you look at your neighbors, all of whom have similar economic characteristics as we do, and they've had the sort of impact that COVID has had on us, then you say that something extraordinary occurred here. But the reality is that what we are suffering now is not the result of COVID. It is a result of deliberate recklessness. You decide that you will spend yourself and become bankrupt because you need to win elections. And you turn around and blame COVID. As if the people you are telling this do not have the capacity to process information and assess what the true situation is. And then, in addition to their failure to meet any target, right, they also suffer a huge credibility crisis. Nothing they say <coughs> about this economy can be believed. Felix, before you go on, are you suggesting that COVID and the Russian-Ukraine war did not affect the economy? Randy, of course, there is not one country that escaped the effects of COVID. Mm -hmm. But in order to assess the accuracy of that claim, you need to look at whether or not COVID hits any other country apart from Ghana. You see, it is not a, a cholera outbreak, or a malaria outbreak, or an Ebola outbreak. This one, they call it a pandemic because it was everywhere at the same time. So, really, how is it that countries that have relatively weaker economic structures and fundamentals than us, like Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Co., who also suffered COVID, just like we did, are not posting the sort of terrible outcomes you are posting. What is the outcome? Why? Sierra does not have the deficit you have. They didn't run a double digit deficit. Indeed, all the countries in West Africa have deficits below 7%. Cote d'Ivoire does not have inflation close to even 10%. So, what are you talking about? Name me one West African country that has these outcomes. And I'll get out of this to you and concede that you've won this bit. You don't have it. None exists. Randy Togo, Burkina Faso. Burkina Faso has been under military dictatorship. Mali is under military dictatorship, but they don't have these outcomes. They do not have the sort of debt that you have incurred. You knew exactly what you were doing. You simply decided that you would go for broke. You will do everything it takes to win elections without regard for the consequences. That is why you are here. And at every given opportunity, you want to make excuses with COVID. Now, how does Sierra Leone outperform you? Sierra Leone. A, a country that for several years was under the destructive impact of war. How do they outperform you economically? And you cite COVID. As for them, in, in some times past, they suffered from Ebola. And yet, their economy is showing greater resilience than you. Right? I was making the point about the lack of credibility. Right. 
Today, my brother says that they should be commended for some of the steps they've taken, including going to the IMF, including the debt exchange and what have you. Randy, was it not this same finance minister and his deputies who flatly denied that they were not going to go to the IMF? Indeed, his boss, al Baobia, was it not the one who made the IMF look like devils with horns and tails in 2016? And in a sweeping fashion, branded the NDC government incompetent because they went to the IMF. In fact, before they went to the IMF, any time you criticize them on the economy, their last line of defense was that they had not gone to the IMF. So within months or weeks of denying that you will go to the IMF, you go. Randy, when the minority leader, the now minority leader, Honorable Atofosi, said at a function at UPSC last year that there were going to be haircuts, was it not just 24 hours after that that the president of this country denied that there will be haircuts? And in this budget, the minister speaks about the haircuts. They cynically call it the domestic debt exchange program. Under which they've taken over 100 billion Ghana cities belonging to bond holders. People who have purchased bonds and expect that the interest or coupons on which their livelihoods depend will be honored, have been denied. Some too have their principles maturing. Those have been extended by lengthy periods. And you say that this is something that you ought to be praised for because it's the decision you took. Randy, when they took this decision, they did not have a choice. There was nothing they could do. Nothing. They had run out of options. If they didn't do that, our economy would cease to exist. So it was under those conditions that they resorted to this. It was not something that they even thought about. They were forced to do that. And no Ghanaian government has had to do this. <coughs> and the pain and suffering that this sort of maneuver has caused is unprecedented. The entire Ghanaian middle class Randy, risk being wiped out because of this. The pain and anguish out there, Randy, you feel it. It is palpable. You can cut it with a knife. How does the government praise itself for doing this? You cause such harm to people. People's livelihoods have been destroyed. Pensioners, Randy, pensioners. And you know that the, the minister hinted that now pension funds are going to be affected by the next round of the debt exchanges. So they are negotiating. Debt exchange. They are negotiating. Already, pensioners have had to pick it at the Ministry of Finance on a regular basis to demand that the terms of their bonds are on it. And he says that we should praise them because it is an action that government took. When he speaks about stability of the currency, in the first eight months of last year, the city depreciated by 54%. 54%. Basically wiping out its value. In some places, you could get it for 17 cities to a dollar. Now, it was around 12 cities. But when you go and check the criticism that, that the MPP, led by Laji Baumia, who was supposed to be some economic whisked, leveled at the NDC when the dollar exchanged against the city at 3.8 cities. You have several videos of him mounting the more higher ground sitting in some ivory tower and purporting to give lectures and condemning the government that had this exchange rate. Today, at 12%, they say we should clap for them. They've achieved stability. Randy, what they are not telling you is the deleterious effect this has had on businesses. Businesses have vanished because of this. Large-scale unemployment has happened because of this. Livelihoods have been destroyed because of this. Payments that people had to do have tripled in the period. How do you achieve any plaudit for this kind of conduct? You were sitting in opposition, <laughs> shooting off your mouth and claiming that you had expertise to manage the exchange rate. You come into power and the exchange rate runs amok. And if you read the presentation of Mr. Media yesterday, he says that in the first quarter of last year, the city depreciated by 22% against the dollar. Right? The same level of appreciation is in the same document. 
In the first quarter of this year, in January this year, the city depreciated by 22%, the same as last year. So there's every indication that at some point we are going to go back to that period. So there's absolutely nothing to celebrate about the performance of the MPP. Today, inflation for June, right? Really, inflation for June was 42.5%, not so. Mm. In the period, there have been two increments in fuel price. And I hear that today, fuel price will go up by 9%. Two right. weeks ago, there was another increment. So what that means is that inflation is almost certain to go up for July. And you say we've turned the corner. Which corner? Randy, which corner have they turned? Look at the hardships that your economic policies have foisted on people. Look at how people are suffering to make ends meet. Even one meal a day has become a luxury. For the vast majority of the Ghanaian people, when you say you've turned the corner, Randy, how do the numbers that the minister even presented as the projected figures for 2023 show that we've turned any corner? If you look at page 18 of his own media budget, he says that they have had to cut the projected GDP growth rate from 2.8% to 1.5%. Randy, if you grow at 1.5%, how can that be turning the corner? Last year, you grew at 3.1%. This year, you are going at 1.5%. You say you've turned the corner. What kind of corner turning is that? Are you working backwards or what? They said that inflation will be 31.3%. Randy, I have grave doubts that they will achieve this, given the rate at which fuel price is going up and how the city tends to behave these days. But even 31.3% inflation is catastrophic. It means that your disposable income will lose 31.3% of its value. And yet you promised single digit inflation when you were in opposition. You were berating a government that had inflation at 15.4%. And when you say that you are projecting to get 31%, which, which clearly is an unattainable target, you say we should praise, we should praise you, but you've turned the corner. He is going on and on about some primary balance of 1.2%. Randy, under the IMF program, they are required to do positive primary balance. You are required to do... So. Look, you see, the, the savings that they are supposed to do under domestic debt exchange. In other words, they are not paying interest. Those monies have to be used to build a buffer so that when you start paying in 2026 and beyond, you have money to do. So you are, you are under a program. And somebody is holding a stick over your neck to ensure that to ensure that your expenditure is within control. When you were left to your own devices last year, we saw the outcomes. So there's absolutely nothing to celebrate. Nothing at all to celebrate. You have net domestic net reserves of less than a month. And you are saying you've turned the corner. We should praise you. And right, you see. Sometimes when you speak about the economy, you stand the risk of speaking in abstract terms. Because these are macroeconomic figures. That's the overall picture. But it's when you drill down, the impact that this is having on all other sectors is mind-boggling. Now look at what is happening in the health sector. How they are unable to pay the NHIS in the manner that they should. The areas they owe, that land is at a standstill. Because no monies are going in there. You've capped it, and then you've collateralized the proceeds. Look at the energy sector. Randy, about a month ago, we all had to live in uncertainty because the IPPs were threatening to shut down. And they contribute over 60% to our energy mix. Electricity mix, I your pardon. So at the last minute, you have to go and pay something small in order that they do not shut down. Randy, look at the cocoa sector. They have wrapped up up to 15 billion Ghana cities in debt. And this year, Projections are that they will achieve less than 700,000 metric tons of cocoa production. From a height of almost 1 million in 2017. So every sector is down. Right? Look at the education sector. And indeed, I was looking at a, a communique issued by a group of civil society organizations in education. Education World, Action Aid and Co. Right? According to them, as we speak, there are 5,400 schools under trees. 5,400. When we were in power, we encountered about 3,000. 
So before between 2010 and 2016, we awarded 2,900 schools and at-risk projects. By the time we left our, almost 2,200 had been completed. But in the seven years that this government has been around, and having received over 800 billion Ghana cities in total revenue from all sources, schools and at-risk have increased to 5,400. According to the civil society organizations, in 2020, they announced a program to replace this. To date, only 17 have been completed. Look at the disparity. 5,400 schools and trees, only 17 have been completed. That can be counted. Randy, the same civil society organizations, according to their research, have discovered that up to 1 million Ghanaian pupils, when they go to school, they either sit on the floor or they lie on their stomach because they don't have access to desks. What education are you hoping to give these one million Ghanaian pupils? That is the state of education in this country. When for four years, they have not been able to print textbooks for the very curricula that they have reformed. For four years. Something as basic as that, they cannot meet it. When for six terms, capitation grants have been in arrears. Six terms. And this is how the schools take care of basic, basic supplies, chalk and other things. So look at the state of education under a government formed by Nana Akufuado and Alaji Baumia. So what corner have you turned? The, the, the child lying on his stomach in that dilapidated shed, shed, I beg your pardon, or under a tree. How do you tell him that you've turned the corner? Which corner? The boy is lying on his belly, stomach. And he is competing with children sitting in Scandinavia in classes of about 15, sitting behind world-class facilities to study. What chance does that child have? Does that child have to compete at any level with his colleagues anyway? So they should not add insult to injury by claiming that we have turned the corner. And the point must be made, it must be stressed that we are where we are because of deliberate mismanagement. When the flags started turning red in 2019 and they were warned, they will bomb it arrogantly. Randy, they cannot escape blame. Aladi Baumia is chairman of the economic management team. Yesterday, conspicuously, he was missing from the media budget review. And do you believe that if things were kosher? But he's, he's on yeah, the he campaign was, on too. Sunday, he was mm -hmm. in the AK to campaign. I was there, so mm -hmm. I got wind of it. Randy, but the budget statement is perhaps the most important government activity of the year. So if you are head of an economic management team that is doing well, operating at full throttle, and he'll be there. Just taking a two hours drive. He has a convo, so he probably can do it in one and a half hours. Mm. From Asebu to Accra, to sit for this hearing, doesn't take anything away from his campaign. Indeed, if things were right, he perhaps would not even need to campaign. But he fled, as he has always done, fled. He didn't want to be part of it. And I am still waiting for him to be able to ever mention the phrase domestic debt exchange program. The man who chairs our economic management team cannot even mention perhaps the biggest act of expropriation by any government in our history. He has run away like, from it like a plague. The journey is fled completely. And when was the last time he spoke about the exchange rate? When was the last time he did so? Meanwhile, if I challenge you, I'm sure you can play me 20 clips of his mentioning the exchange rate in, in the run up to the 2016 elections. When was he not the person who, in early 2017, stood on platforms and told us that he had a list of economic waste kids who constituted the economic management team and that the, MPP, the NDC did not have one? Randy, don't you have that clip? Did you not mention his name? Alan Chemantin. Professor Jambafo, Boache Jaku, and Co. Dr. Jeffrey Yakuto. Randy, did he not mention them as constituting a crack economic management team? So why has he run away from the economy suddenly? It is the clearest admission of failure. Because Randy, I can best I can bet my last bottom dollar or peso that if the economy was functioning properly, Dr. Baumia or Alaji Baumia would not let us breathe in this country. Every single minute, he will be pointing to it. But now, he has run away. He claims he has his own vision. A vision that he could not use 
to forestall the collapse of the Ghanaian economy or even to resuscitate it. He wants us to wait for one and a half years for the tenor that he has taken to expire before he pulls a rabbit from the hat. So, those who comment on the economy on behalf of government must exercise great moderation and respect for the people of Ghana. Because the suffering that their incompetence has unleashed is unprecedented. It has not happened. Really. But the entire economic migrant ecosystem is littered with incompetence and irresponsibility. Really, look at the information filtering in from the Bank of Ghana. First of all, in which serious jurisdiction does a governor and his board remain at post when they incur a 60 billion Ghana CD loss in one financial year? Okay, we'll, we'll do the Bank of Ghana situation later. Oh, we right, but we are doing it. Okay. Your time. Uh, we don't have time. Yes, but you see, Randy, look, they have expenditure showing that they spend 67 million Ghana CDs on supposed computer related expenses. Randy, right? even if they were doing quantum computing mm -hmm. at the Bank of Ghana, would they spend 67 million? Crypto monitoring. 131 million Ghana cities mm. servicing vehicles. Mm. Servicing, Randy, that can purchase about 60 land cruisers. Mm. What kind of vehicles what, do they use? What do you call it? Uh, 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 aeroplanes or what? At the Bank of Ghana. What kind of vehicles are they using that require this much to be spent? And the sum total of it is that in one financial year, they have lost 60 billion Ghana cities. And the governor is sitting there. But why? Even the head of the Prime Minister team who supervised this co collapse wants to be president. So why not? Mm. It's a free for all. Mm. Everybody is showing how irresponsible they can be. The finance minister, who we were told by the president, should be allowed to negotiate the IMF deal is still at post. And he has come to present a media budget of doom and gloom, offering no insight into how we are going to get out of this. Yeah. And he says that it is in 2028. So they create a problem starting 2020, and we have to wait for eight years to get out of it. And yet they say they should be given the opportunity to continue to govern. Right. How do you govern so disastrously and expect your mandate to be renewed? Mm -hmm. So what the minister presented yesterday simply means that Ghanaians have to brace themselves mm -hmm. for very, very difficult times. It's as if what we are going through is child's play. Mm -hmm. And Randy, if you read the entire budget, you will see that there's no indication that we are going to get out of this mess anytime soon. No indication. There's no new incentive, no new measures. And I look, the size of government remains the same. Only yesterday I chanced on a, a, a portfolio, a government spokesperson on governance, a government spokesperson on governance. There's one on security. There's one on infrastructure. Uh, specialization. What specialization? Right? So the Minister for West and Housing, Minister for Roads, who also have special assistants and spokespersons, in addition to the Information Service Department's PROs, cannot communicate around the work they are doing. We require another specialist to be given another portfolio mm -hmm. in order to tell the people of Ghana that government has built a bridge. Right? The spokesperson on governance, that's exactly what. What exactly does he do? Right? You tell me. So when the president, I, I, I didn't design the JD. So, so I am, I am, I am, I am making the point yes. that even in the midst of economic catastrophe and disaster, they yes. continue to be reckless. Right. They continue to dissipate money on needless, frivolous things. Why won't you get a, a deficit of eleven point eight percent if you spend like this? All right. Okay. So guys, our time is up. This is what we we'll do. Yeah. Sure. I'll give you five minutes each to wrap mm -hmm. up. All right. So, Doc, I'll start with Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, uh, I, my brother has gone on a cherry picking. Mm -hmm. And that convenience has always, it's always expected that he will go on cherry picking. And uh, the convenience is actually first started with his comparison of 2016 campaign against 2020, 2020 records. When he forgot that in 2020, MPP had a manifesto, which they presented. So you cannot, by any reasonable, rational, and prudent analysis, compare a 2016 manifesto, and you did not compare the result between 2016, 2020, and then make a conclusion based on that. Two, when you present a manifesto, the manifesto was based on 
some underestimation of the disaster, the havoc, the crater that was created by the previous regime. And when the government came to office, they presented a budget. A budget that then reflected the extent, the magnitude of the disaster that was created by their regime. So I would think that you then have to do with the budget that actually presented new estimation and then mark the government against the new estimation that was presented. But he hasn't done that. And I understand that. On the issue of fiscal discipline, for the first time, this government posted positive primary balance for two, three years consecutively. That is fiscal discipline. Okay, and that is the period he's forgetting or he's refusing or he's just glossing his eyes over and not to appreciate that. When the government promised fiscal discipline, it was delivered. The government gave the Fiscal Responsibility Act and benchmarked certain expenditure in terms of uh, I mean, fiscal deficit. Government lived within those particular benchmarks until the 2020 thereafter. Okay, you cannot match and mark the manifesto using post-manifesto era when there was a 2020 manifesto. That's it. His convener analysis has also gone to say that if there's any single country, and even there, and say that you consider the debate won. Of course, the essence of this is not to who wins or who loses, but to educate the Ghanaian people. He has gone to choose poorer countries as a basis. And let me even give him the benefit of that. He mentioned Liberia. Liberia debt to GDP was 92%, 92 point, uh, 92.79%, according to the African Development Bank data. Okay? That's their debt to GDP. That is even the Liberia he's talking of for 2022. Is that better than our country, which is even, I mean, driven by grants? They posted for that year a fiscal deficit of 7.3. We did 9.4. We did 9.4 for a country that is driven by donor grants. Okay, you are doing that comparison with ours. He mentioned go went to Cote d'Ivoire and he mentioned about inflation. Cote d'Ivoire, I mean, uh, uh, Liberia did 6.9 from 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 2.4. Okay. You showed them that is the magnitude of, of the disaster that has caused them. 2.4, they went to 6.9. Okay, that is more than 50%, even 100%, what do you call it, increase in deficit. These are the figures of those. And he's going to say the IMF program requires that we need a positive primary balance. That is not true. That is false. The IMF program, if you go to page 9 of the IMF program, it clearly states our I mean, primary balance position, I mean, uh, target. For that? the year, is 0.5 negative. Okay? Mm -hmm. So that is also not true. So when we are given an opportunity to analyze issue, of course, I don't expect him to do the analysis without throwing doors from, without attacking everyone associated with the economy, without going after Dr. Mahon Bakumia, which is their best shot now to actually attack him anytime he is given opportunity when his name is not even mentioned in the whole process. Okay, and you realize that he has used almost five minutes, ten minutes, and launching attack on Dr. Mahmoud Baumia. Admittedly, if I was, I mean, I could also behave like that and go after Mr. John Bahama. But we are discussing a national budget. And when you are discussing a national budget, we have to take personality and, I mean, kind of some hatred. Of course, he says he's a fiercest critic of uh, Mr. Baumia. I understand. But we have to discuss the issue and know that fidelity to the facts is what the Ghanaian people expect of us. In any case, government has presented a budget. The negative part the government has presented, the positive the government has presented. What I think the Ghanaian people who are descending and do, they should be able to decipher good from bad is that they were able to mark this performance in the context of the problem that we are facing. Government didn't create the problem. How did government cause uh, COVID? What was the role of government in the creation of COVID? The, who, who caused the who, who created the debt situation? No, I'm, 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 government did not create COVID, and I'm telling you that COVID had an impact on the debt situation. How? Okay, how, how? Yes. government had to spend more to protect us, government had to increase the salaries of nurses to protect us, government revenue had to. I mean, deep, I've explained this on this platform yeah, but, even but, today, but doctor, even today, I explain doctor, it. If we do a net off, hold on, yeah. if we do a net off. Of what we got from COVID and what we spent or lost as a result of COVID, COVID cannot be a contributory factor to our debt situation. And I'm saying without any fear of contra contradiction yes. or imagination that yes. COVID is a significant factor 
not even for to our death situation. To our death situation. How? I, we are told you I that. I want you to help me understand it. I, we've done that analysis even on this platform, even today. No, without and, figures. Uh, no, without figures. Yes. That's what the, we did the analysis. But revenue loss from the borders, how much was it? No, tell me. Okay. Yes. I, that's what I'll not be able, but I am, I, am, I am convinced with the figures that I'm privy to that our revenue loss yes. far exceeded, ex exceeded and also included, including what we spent, yes. far exceeded, exceeded what we got from COVID. No, I'm not saying that. It exceeded or didn't exceed. Uh -huh. But you're saying that COVID was a significant contributor to our debt situation. Yes. And let me tell you one. One you've not even averted your mind to. Yes. COVID caused us our CD depreciation, which has actually also caused. No, that's what I'm saying. You are, when you are doing analysis and you are not, you are not broadening your horizons on this issue, he knows <laughs> that COVID caused us more in terms of our, our, our depreciation of said because our exports, okay, which you have used, to show our reserves at the central bank was affected. Okay, so if you don't now, do all these analysis, our imports were not affected. If, 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 Did COVID not affect our imports? Our, that's our imports. Import, but let me make my point. When you were making your point, I think I gave you no, the no, benefit no, of no, all no, the time. No, no, okay, no, I give you the why, benefit why, of all the time. No, no. You see, it had dual effect. Yes. Okay, mm. border closing means that certain goods coming in will definitely not come. Mm. It also had effect on our commodity prices. Yes. Fuel prices, which is our major export, yes. okay, yes. almost went to zero. Yes. Okay, yes. and people forget that people don't even analyze this into the factor of COVID effect on yes. our revenue yes. and our expenditure. Yes. Okay, cocoa prices. Mm -hmm. It was only gold that stabilized within the period. Almost all our foreign exchange earnings mm -hmm. was significantly dipped, and you say mm -hmm. COVID has no imp impact mm -hmm. on our debt situation. Mm -hmm. When your debt is measured to GDP. And your GDP is contingent on these factors. Mm. I will be wondering the sort of analysis someone will be doing mm. if you don't put all this no, into it's the analysis. The, it's not the putting. You, you, uh, what you studied, know that you must always put figures to these things. That's what it's not that we, the, we can we can put if, if, the, if you if you are bringing speech, us to yes. actually discuss the impact of COVID yeah. in extenso. And we are going to discuss that mm. in terms of figure. I'm ready to for that debate. Right. Okay, I'm ready to provide that debate. Right. But because it is a, a mean, tangential issue measured within the context of this discussion, mm. we need to highlight the parameter of well, the transmission mechanism through mm. which COVID is affecting us. Mm. To place figures on them mm. from, I mean, promptly will be difficult. Mm. But we, I can I provide agree. that. I can mm. provide that if we are going to have no an problem. extensive discussion on this. So no please, mm. let us stick to the issues. Okay. Let us not say that, look, it is not only Ghana, every single economy. Mm. And we admit that every single one, and that's why half of the world went to the IMF for its support program. Okay? We admit that it is not only Ghana. And that is why half of the world economies mm. went to the IMF, seeking IMF support how many, program. How many of the half are doing uh, uh, DDP? How many of the half that went to the IMF have defaulted? Any single country that is going to the IMF program yes. for an IMF support program with yes. a debt problem, this is another problem, we have to do a debt exchange program. No, you are not answering my question. I'm, I'm, I'm just giving you... Ex I'm just telling no, I'm you saying you are not answering my question. It's like saying that Ghana has gone to the IMF 17 times. But never in the previous 16 have we gone to the IMF with a DD. I said any country that's going to the IMF and take yes. my words with yes. a debt sustainability problem. Mm. Okay? With a debt sustainability problem, we have to How move. many countries? Th that's what I'm saying. These are the figures. When you ask no, me because you said half, half I'm, I'm the said world has gone to the IMF. I've gone. So I'm saying that but almost how more many than, of those who have gone to the IMF have gone for a debt sustainability? It's a different question from what I presented. And you are talking about debt sustainability. And I'm saying that, for instance, Zambia went. Okay, they are not even so successful. Greece was not able, was not able to succeed with that. Okay, we have several countries we can mention, mm. but I'm just saying that mm. you know, um, if you let me, um, you monitor me on this particular point, mm. if I don't have sanity of figures on something, I'm hesitant, yeah, in mentioning mm. them, and that because I don't want to put a figure right. out there who turn out not to be true. That's okay, okay, That's fine. but I can give you countries that have gone through this particular process, and they are very, they are, they are, they are feeling, I mean, the real effects of that is evident, right? So, please. Let us stick to that. Mm. Let us know that not only Ghana, we agree, mm. other countries have experienced it. And those mm. countries have also actually, some of them were even IMF program. They mentioned Togo all the time, mm. Burkina Faso. Mm. They forget that, Cote d'Ivoire, they forget that these countries were even on a subsistence IMF program.
So a country that is within a subsistence IMF program mm -hmm. will not affect will not be affected as much as those countries that were out of an IMF program mm -hmm. that is borrowing at a commercial rate mm -hmm. that is not receiving grants and I mean uh, uh, concessional loans as expected. Mm -hmm. So let us compare apples to apples. Right. Thank you. Ali, thank you. So sir. let's compare apples to apples. Mm -hmm. I mean, what kind of joke is it? For somebody to tell me that a country that has an inflation of 6.9% is the same as one that recorded 54.1%. No, it's taking it from where they were. Randy, no, but how? Yeah, first first of all, the Randy, look at the disparity. Look at the disparity. Yeah. Liberia has inflation of 6.9%, let's say even 7%. Mm. At the end of last year, you had inflation of 54.1%. Now it is 42.5%. Now you said that they are just like you. I mean, what kind of analysis is this? But you used to find your fiscal and debt. It says they are debt to GDP. Yeah, yeah. But why, Randy? What our debt, debt to GDP ratio crossed hundred and four percent. Hundred and four percent. When at a that? point, that is what. Why the IMF uh, when they came to Ghana to do the Article Four consultations, mm. did they not publish that report? Did we not see it clearly? Mm. You were seeking to hide SOE debts, which they added. Mm. It was hundred and four percent. So our debt was simply not sustainable. How do you even compare yourself to? Other countries, Cote d'Ivoire. Is Cote d'Ivoire anywhere near where you are in terms of debt? You are, which metric are you better in than Cote d'Ivoire or Togo? Randy, IMF, who says that is the first time that countries have gone to the IMF? Ghana, haven't you been to the IMF 17 times? Mm. So, Kobe didn't play any role in our going to the IMF. You just mismanaged your economy into bankruptcy. Randy, has Togo defaulted on his debt? Cote d'Ivoire, have they defaulted on their debt? And you see, this COVID excuse. You see, that's why I say that they do not respect the people they are governing. Randy, how much money in all did they spend on even the freebies? Salary increments, everything. They should put it together and tell us. And Randy, in any event, when they did all of that, did Alaji Bamiya not go and stand in Cape Coast and say that because they have done these things, people should vote for them? Randy, did you not hear him? He says that because they've given free electricity, free water, they've increased salaries of nurses and doctors. Because of that, they are a caring government, so people should vote for them. But when the cost of those things destroy your economy, you say we should not blame you. You want credit, but the blame should be heaped on somebody else. And Randy, is it Dr. Tia must understand? As for his boss, his name will never escape the lips of anybody analyzing Ghana's economy. Why? And it is not this bottle that chairs the economic management team. So I will not blame this bottle. I will blame Baumia morning, afternoon, evening. He says that we are going after him. This is no, 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 no. Randy, Randy. When he was, Randy, the clips you play, yes. that one, it was his daily prayer. It was his breakfast, lunch, supper. It was his communion. The clips you play. When he was doing that, whose name was he mentioning? Randy, was he mentioning this bottle's name? Was it not mentioned the name of the president at the time and his vice president who headed the economic management team? So why must he be given a pass? We should go and blame who? Never my late grandmother in her grave at Tusu Cemetery. Never mentioned his name. Oh, he didn't mention Mahmoud's name. Only, I mean, no, no, Randy, he didn't mention Mahmoud's name ever. questions to answer. No, that was he did not mention Mahmoud's name. <laughs> he did not, no, so the 170 questions, did he ask this cap to answer them? What are you talking about? <laughs> The, his 170 question, that joke, that joke that he calls 170 questions. Did he ask this cap to answer them? Who did he ask to answer those questions? The, this cap, right? You see, you must respect your viewers. As for your boss, he will never escape blame. Look, if he is a man, eh, let him mention domestic debt exchange program, if he is a man. Since that thing happened, he has never mentioned it. What serious chairman of an economic management team will avoid such a significant what do you call it, economic measure, by the government that he is part of. He is just evading those tough subjects in a cowardly fashion, that's all. He is burying his head under the sun, hoping that it will blow over. And you see, that is a clearest sign that he is not fit to be president because he cannot take responsibility for anything. The first cardinal principle of leadership is that you take responsibility. That's why they say in Akan, if he cannot take responsibility, he should not waste our time appearing on the ballot paper. That is what you are doing. You want others to be blamed. When you stood on a platform and told us that you had a sterling economic management team, that team, what were they doing? They were eating Gary Sokins 
at their meetings. Not, not so. So whose responsibility was it to manage this economy? Who manages it? Randy, is it the pen that manages this economy? So if you can't take responsibility, don't waste our time. You have failed in an appalling manner. Destroyed an economy that was so healthy at the time that you took over. Randy, our deficit in 2016 was 6.3%. For three years running, you have doubled this deficit. And you said that you've done well. Three years running, you have doubled the deficit you inherited. And Randy, he criticized the deficit of 2016. You should go and read Kendo Foyate's first budget presentation. In March 2017, he gave an update of the economic situation they came to inherit. In President Akufuado's first State of the Nation address, if he has not read it, I encourage him to read it. He summarized Ghana's economic situation. He condemned the public debt of 120 billion. When you take it to 500 billion, nobody will applaud you. You will be condemned. Right. Randy, the inflation rate Ken Ofriata stated in his first budget was 15.4%. If the inflation climbs to 51.5%, you will be condemned, not praised. All right. So, yeah. Randy, we cannot afford to have yes. a coward as president. If you don't have the heart mm. to take responsibility, <laughs> don't waste our time. Mm. You see, the people of Ghana, the 31 million people who are depending on government policies to survive, mm. cannot afford a coward in charge of this country. All right, okay. We need to go. Do Dr. Tia, just, just as a precursor to our discussion, mm. this is from the... Uh, the budget the, yes the budget mm -hmm. uh, dealing with the revenue performance yeah. so you see uh, this 2019 and then 2020 mm. the projections and the outends yeah. uh, you see them there yeah all right okay so thanks yeah. gentlemen yeah. For, for joining me um, on the show uh, up next uh, GMG Trends There's more blessing in giving than receiving. Kwa kuni ufie fanya na enkobo de makers insura na undeuro. The pneumatological abrasion of the Lord revealed unto me this night that me and my household should go out into the world and bless the world. Makers Electronics Company Limited. I am up to 67 percent discount. I was selected appliances as well. And did you break us this year? This is what I call quintessential immaculability. Jamu. She said the Makers Electronics Company Limited. I was tied for Burkina Highway. I'm a Samai Zongo Junction. I the K Pharmacy Dining. Oh yeah, I fat him and Boga Junction. Ashaman, Valco Flat, Kumasi, Ahinema Koko Bain, Asafu Wachi Hospital Junction, Takwadi, Fia Kuma, Number 9 Market. Go and tell mom and dad about the Maker's Blessing Attack Program. From 0552 222 253 and 0552 222 254. Terms and conditions apply. The same in Gato Moon, I'm a CC. Yamawa Kwaba, the ban Nadum Auto Fix and Accessories. Aha, the a banu KSC C and Yamwa Kandia. Ubenya bi 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 waha. KBI ane ne how any new here. Yansu ye wohwe nim de fuwa obe swa nu yi yamao. Nadum Auto Fix and Accessories ye jume diye diye. Aye twenty four seven oh ye CC u engine, u brake, battery. Yase sa o tie. Se banu car wash diya. Ye wo abe funfi diye biti se steamer. Ye de hoka engine, abra ansu onko engine nim. Ye san ye detailing metre se. Ye bi chuchu ka nimu be biya mao. Ye wia ya san polisho ka na mao kama. Enye uwe nimu kuhu ya san to car batteries. 
tires, rims, and the kicker count. Manadum auto fix and accessories, Emma Oka, and Sinny Dedem, then where you mama. She shall yet chill a coin what down Suman, I saw it down who are any KFC boy, her name, and one crying. So open information and answer and be Sebia. Fresno 24 651 9369. Nadum auto fix and accessories. Who crying so young, papa papa? All right, welcome back to the show. If you just joined us, this is Morning Ghana Live on Metro TV. Time to check out what is trending on social media with Desi the Star Boy. But uh, there's been 10 years of transforming spaces into havens of beauty and functionality. Graceful Adventures has made this dream a reality for countless individuals and businesses. And now their showroom, located at number 2 John Neo Wood Street, uh, opposite the Kisaman Park, they have swivel chairs that embrace you with every turn, sofas that invite you to sink into the embrace after a long day, conference tables that become the epicenter of your team's creativity. And Graceful Adventures have you covered from sleek file cabinets to elegant workstations and many uh, more. You can reach um, Graceful Adventures on 0501-672-776 or 0501 672 Triple seven and get anniversary discounts and gifts. Graceful Adventures, luxury redefined. Desi, Look, what's going on? Good, uh, a, a, a lot uh, mm. coming back uh, from the weekend where there was mm. lots of activities, including the big wedding. Yeah, the big wedding of of uh, the exclusive wedding. Yeah, the exclusive wedding. Mm. <laughs> yeah, so let's get into some of the details uh, this morning. So let's get into some of your comments that have come in. So this one says that from Musabato, I have no hope in the media budget because looking at how the Bank of um, Ghana, um, okay, so we'll get that in a bit. But a lot of people have been reacting to what happened um, yesterday with respect to the media budget and uh, so it says that uh, the Bank of Ghana and Presidency spent taxpayers' money. Jonathan Atri says, I've listened to a professor this morning on another network and now listening to a doctor on this network trying to defend the budget review and uh, I am outstanding at their incoherence. That's from Jonathan Atri. And then we move on to the next uh, one. Kudi J says that upon all the analysis, paste is so... <laughs> <laughs> it's still so that 20 cities are poor. Toothpaste. Yeah. Anyway, let's move away from that and, and talk about Ofriata. The um, finance minister yesterday presented the budget. Lots of people have been reacting to the budget uh, mentioning today. So let's take a look at some of them. There's one funny one in Ghana. I'll try and read that. Joe Jackson says that Honorable Ken Ofriata claimed we have turned the corner. However, all the macroeconomic projections worsened. In the mid year budget review. Okay, so that's from Joe Jackson there. And uh, this one says that in opposition, the NPP raised fire and brimstone and mounted the most fierce resistance to the national single window system. And an integrated risk management system contract was awarded. And this one says that the finance minister, Ken Ferrata, says we have turned the corner. Then the following day, four prices increased by 9%. So which corner was turned? Yet the middle class is quiet. All right. This one says, therefore, the violent takes it by force. I am sure Ken Friata must have quoted the scripture in this case. He is an expert in quoting the scripture than real economic and finance issues. Okay. And uh, there's uh, another one that says, Ishakpakpa. Finance minister, Ishakpakpa. 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 Uh-huh. Oh. oh. That's what it means. That's what it means. Uh -huh. Ishakpakpa. Yeah. <laughs> all right, so in pigeon they'll say Isha Dread. Isha Dread. Look, there's a, a lady trained on Twitter called Amagopna. So she she finished law school. Yes. And she was a boy. You remember when the CJ yes. came in? Yes. Now there's a video servicing um, where the CJ 
was uh, talking, well, she didn't necessarily mention her name, but mm. I mean, people draw inferences saying that oh, mm. it is there. So let's watch the video and then we'll take a look at some of the reactions from that. And then when somebody has behaved in a certain, in a certain way, we say we cannot call the person to the bar. I was surprised at the fury that rose up concerning the call to the bar of certain people. And I thought, like, seriously? This is proper conduct for the, for, for the legal sector? That's interesting. Anyway, so for you to come into our space and to come into the space of the legal sector, your conduct cannot be obscene and offensive and you expect that you'll be admitted. It doesn't work like that. Your comments on social media. Your ex so that's just a bit of the video um, that, that, that came out. And yes, like seriously. Mm. Yes. That's my response. Like seriously. Yes, like seriously. So Alma Governor has been reacting to it. Okay. And uh, let's uh, take a look at some of her tweets. So she says that, respectfully, I'm still waiting to be told what my improper conduct was from the 6th of November 2022 till date. And she continues, um, I cannot handle this tarnishing of image and spread of false information about the true fact of the event that took place for much longer. This is cruel. And mm. uh, she adds that, what was my crime? She goes on and on about that. What was my actual crime? What did I do? What did Amal Governor Girl actually do wrong? I see that there's a blatant disregard for Article 1911 of our grand norm highest law of the land, the Constitution 1992, time and time again in this issue. So she did a whole thread talking about everything that happened. Okay, so every institution has its um, ethics, mm. moral codes and everything. Yeah. And so I wouldn't have a problem with the um, legal fraternity having any such thing. You know, I don't know where I'm a governor can seek redress from. Mm. You understand me? But the only thing I have to say to um, her lordship, the chief justice, is that yes, she was advising a prospective mm -hmm. lawyers, lawyers, law students. Yeah. So it was good admonishment for them and all that to be careful and to do the things that are right and all that, because. They don't want certain people to join them. Mm. But what about those who are part of them already? As we speak, in the valedictory judgment of Justice Jones Doche, mm -hmm. who just went on retirement, yeah. he has actually, in that valedictory judgment, he has pointed out to the conduct of an appeal court judge, who was then a high court judge, and as I asked the Chief Justice to immediately take steps, and if you read the, the views or the comments of the Supreme Court judges mm -hmm. about this particular judge, yes, sir. who is still an appeals court judge, those are some of the things that for us outside their fraternity, mm -hmm. we would want to, see want to see what they do about those things. That is what will convince us that indeed they are interested and not only about the conduct of those who seek to join them, but those who are already, already a part of them. Yeah. Yes. Well, uh, we, we'll see in the coming days. Amma, Amma says that she, she's working on that. Um, what, what would happen with that? But as we wrap up, uh, wrap up with what happened on Saturday, uh, Bright Time meeting got hitched, and a lot of, there was a lot of excitement um, there. So let's, if you missed it, so let's just watch a few of the videos. I will send you the